Welcome to Unconventional Thinking Workshop 2021. It's hard to believe it's been three years since our last workshop. Uh, this is being recorded, so it will be available uh, on Fruit. I'll post the link and let's get started with our first update. And I think that is Michael Brownbridge or, um, yeah, okay. Go Michael. Thank you, Wendy. I jumped, I jumped the gun a bit there. Can you see me okay? As in my screen? Yes, we can see your screen. Awesome. Thanks, Wendy. Uh, good morning, everybody. It is a beautiful morning. I should be outside joining those uh, great workers. So just to give you a, a very brief uh, update on some uh, changes to Bioworks portfolio of uh, products or upcoming changes to Bioworks portfolio of products for uh, the grape sector. Uh, you may be familiar with uh, Millstop potassium bicarbonate fungicide. It's a contact biofungicide. <clears throat> it does have organic approval for those who are interested. Um, interesting product. It brings a very different or different modes of action to bear. So it can be a very uh, useful standalone or a rotational tool, or even a tank mix partner in uh, a resistance management program. Um, the nice thing about the formulation is that it's, it's pre-formulated with uh, surfactant. So it's basically, you have the product, uh, it makes it much easier, quicker to uh, load the spray tank with it. It's used in, in two different ways, essentially, if you want to use it as a, as a standalone product, as a preventative, uh, if sprayed at sort of the first signs of disease every seven to 10 days, if disease pressures are pretty low. But uh, we know mil uh, powdery mildew can sort of get away very, very quickly if, if not watched. <clears throat> so there is also, uh, it can be used curatively. Uh, it's a highly effective rescue product that can provide that curative control uh, at a higher rate. Uh, so we have the two rates, preventative rate, 2.8 kilograms per hectare, curative rate, 5.6 kilograms per hectare. What's new, it's already registered for powdery mildew control, but what is um, new is that we're looking to get a label expansion on Millstop to uh, include botrytis on the label. Um, these results actually came from trials Wendy ran a few years ago, where the trials were done to specifically assess the efficacy of millstop uh, against botrytis uh, in wine grapes in, in this particular example on uh, Riesling grapes. So the product was applied weekly from Verizon to harvest and significant the millstop spray significantly reduced botrytis severity in grape bunches. So in addition to providing a effective control of powdery mildew, the uh, product can be used against a, a broader range of diseases than that. And that's what this label expansion will allow you uh, to do. So the application is in the works. We anticipate getting a, a decision on or around November of this year. Unfortunately, uh, probably uh, too late for use uh, against botrytis this year, but uh, nonetheless, it'll be available uh, for the 2022 season. <clears throat> Moving on to uh, something completely different. That's um, a new registration, which is uh, in the works currently. Um, this is a, a Bioworks product, which actually originated out of New Zealand from a company called Botryzen. Um, they have had the product registered and used in New Zealand wine grapes and kiwi fruit orchards since about 2008. Uh, Bottery Stop is the name that Bioworks has put to this uh, product in North America. Uh, it's been registered and available for use in the US as Bottery Stop since 2016. And it's currently used in a variety of greenhouse ornamentals, but also uh, several field crops. The formulation that is currently sold is a water dispersible granule. Um, what we've done since 2016 is come up with a uh, new wettable powder formulation, um, which has sort of uh, better stability, ease of, ease of use. And that's the product we're going forward with for registration in Canada. So a little bit more about uh, uh, Bottery Stop. 
it's um, as the name implies primarily targeting um, uh, the product for use against uh, botrytis and this is on uh, all parts of the plant um, the product itself contains a saprophytic fungus called Ula cladium udmansii, strain U3. Uh, it's, it's unique amongst biocontrol fungi, I would say, because it, it, it doesn't really um, work as an antagonist uh, per se, or as a parasite or uh, anything like that. But it's parasit, it's saprophytic rather activity is how it, it, it uh, controls botrytis, because what it does it will colonize dead, damage, and senescing plant tissues. Um, and these, of course, are places where botrytis typically likes to go in and colonize. And by it's a very aggressive fungus, and it will uh, outcompete botrytis pathogen for the resources that are available in these uh, senescing and uh, damaged plant tissues. And by basically out-competing botrytis for the resources at, in those niches, it prevents the disease from getting a foothold on the plant. Uh, it can be used as a standalone, but it's also compatible with many uh, standard foliar fungicides. So again, it provides a biological option that can be rotated in with traditional disease management products. Um, and that might be necessary when disease pressures are high or conditions are favorable uh, for the disease to occur. The registration status, like I said, we have the new uh, wettable powder formulation uh, that we've been developed for improved shelf life and ease of use. Efficacy trials are in progress um, with a full submission and we're anticipating all being well uh, to the PMRA late Q4 2022. Um, I'm being perhaps overly optimistic here, but uh, if the stars align and uh, uh, everything works out okay, then this will we, we would love to make this product available to the industry in 2023. And again, it's a, a unique product, leaves no residues, um, organic uh, biopesticide, uh, but you can use it in conventional systems as well. So um, and I included uh, Cohort Wholesale for those of you who may or may not know, Cohort sort of a, a spin out company from plant products. Um, and they are the distributors of uh, all the Bioworks products in sort of central and Eastern Canada. So any questions, I would be happy to answer them now. I think in order to stay on time, we're going to hold off questions until we have a break, if that's okay. That's fine with me, Wendy. Okay, so uh, both Greg Rogers and Tim Johnson have asked to be on in the nine o'clock slot. So since Tim is up, Greg, I hope you'll have time after this before you head off for your vaccination. So uh, Tim Johnson from Marone Bio now, please. Sorry about that. I forgot to take myself off of mute before popping the uh, presentation on the screen and then I couldn't figure out the button. Okay. Let the slideshow. Okay. So uh, just real quick, briefly mentioned that Marone Bio Innovations is a publicly <coughs> traded company. So this is called a safe harbor statement basically saying, of course, I may talk about future registrations today, and those, of course, can impact revenues and can never be predicted safely. So anyway, enough of that. So our latest offering in Canada is Stargus uh, Biofungicide. Uh, this is our second full year in which it will be available in the marketplace. Uh, Stargus is a bacillus-based fungicide. If you look at the label, it'll say bacillus emoliquefaciens strain F727. Uh, there will be a future label change where that will be changed to Bacillus necromeri, as the species has been changed, but that's a little bit irrelevant to the grower. It's a liquid product. Uh, depending on the label, the use rate is anywhere from two to eight liters per hectare. 
Uh, the label includes a few vegetables, uh, a little bit on tree fruit and grapes that I'll talk about, as well as some field crops. Uh, what's important is that the uh, product contains peptides that are produced during fermentation, plus SAR activity, which means it's triggering some plant defense functions. We believe it's these peptides that are the predominant mode of action for this product. It has excellent tank mix compatibility, and it can also be used with uh, low load copper fungicides. We often get asked about compatibility with copper. So the frac code is BM02. So if we look at the label today for this year for tree, fruit, and grapes, it's pretty small. What we'll see is grapes for downy mildew and black rot at two to five liters per hectare. I would definitely urge people to use the, uh, the upper end of that rate range. And you will note that it does not include powdery mildew. So uh, there are a number of different bacillus-based fungicides on the market. They definitely have their own unique activities. And for this product, it's a downy mildew black rot target for grapes. We do have a, uh, a label expansion submission that actually two different submissions. One is a, a C submission, one is a URMULE submission that is pending at, at uh, PMRA. One will expand the grape label to include botrytis and we've submitted that at five liters per hectare. Uh, we've also got a submission to add apples for powdery mildew control and also peaches for peach scab and bacterial spot. And we anticipate that we'll have approval towards the end of this year. So that will be available for 2022. Now our first offering in Canada is Regalia Max. It's been on the marketplace for a number of years. Also a liquid product, uh, kind of an interesting label in that it's 0.125 to 0.25% volume to volume, which basically means we're at 1.25 to 2.5 liters per hectare when we're going out with a thousand liters of water per hectare, say in grapes or, or tree fruit. The active ingredient is an extract of Renutria satilinensis. <clears throat> the mode of action is totally based on ISR and SAR activity. There's no in vitro activity against the disease organism. So that means very much that this is a preventative product. So as Michael mentioned, when talking about Millstop uh, having a good curative activity, uh, Regalia Max is very much a preventative. And then if you do happen to get uh, some disease that crops up, you can come in with a different product as sort of a cleanup. So for Regalia Max, the frac code is P5. <clears throat> the product has good compatibility with other fungicides, both chemical and biological. If we look at today's label for tree, fruit, and grapes, there's quite a few uses. Uh, the primary use on grapes is powdery mildew, but it also has decent botrytis activity. And then on apples and pears, we have powdery mildew and the sooty blotch and fly spec complex listed. And we also have listed on the label pre-harvest applications to help suppress post-harvest rots, just, such as white, white rot, alternaria, and bitter rot. And then in the stone fruit complex, it's labeled for powdery mildew, brown rot, and blossom blight, all at the same uh, use rate. We have also submitted uh, somewhat recently and is under review with PMRA, the Regalia product that we sell in the US, which is a 5% product. Uh, we expect that label before the end of this year. And once we have that, we will then re, uh, phase out Regalia Max. So the Regalia 5% product is actually a more dilute product compared to five, or compared to Regalia Max, which is 20%. Uh, there's some advantages there in that it will be easier to measure for smaller quantities in protected agriculture and nurseries. It's actually a much better formulation from a uh, mixing point of view. It's easier to clean up spray equipment uh, but it will require a little bit higher use rate, essentially 4x higher. But it does bring the Regalia product in Canada in line with the same formulation that we sell in the US. So from a supply chain point of view, it definitely uh, makes things easier for us. Uh, it will have a very broad label, similar to Regalia Max, with some additional horticultural uses that will include fire blight on apples and several diseases on cotton ball that uh, on cranberry and early and late rot that has been uh, requested by the cranberry industry. We'll also see a change in the label. So instead of percent volume to volume, we'll be going to liters per hectare. Nice thing about the Regalia product family is that it's very complementary to Stargus with a very minimal overlap. So if we look at the Regalia 5% label, uh, what we expect is gonna look very similar to the Regalia Max with the exception of adding fire blight 
for apples and pears. And then the use rate will probably be in the five to 10 liter per hectare rate. Uh, we do see a lot of tank mixing in the US at two and a half liters, uh, but that probably will not be on the Canadian label. And that brings us to insecticides. We have uh, had plans and intentions to register Grandivo and Venerate in Canada for quite a few years. Uh, these are dead microbes, metabolite based active ingredients. So we're in a little bit of a gray area as to whether or not we are classified as a conventional pesticide or as a microbial. We're in a little bit of an in between uh, novel microbes, you might say. And uh, they're two very different products. Grandivo is based on dead chromobacterium subsugi cells and spent fermentation media. Venerate is based on heat killed Burkholderia retagensis. Grandivo is a WDG, Venerate's a liquid. Uh, they both are metabolite based and they both have activity on a lot of the same pests, a lot of sucking pests, as well as certain Lepidoptera and Coleoptera. <clears throat> one key difference is that Grandivo is pretty active on spotted wing Drosophila. That's one of our more significant markets in the US and also there would be a need for that in Canada. But it looks like we're probably gonna submit Venerate first to PMRA and that is largely because of its use as a seed treatment in corn and soybeans, it's uh, become quite popular in North America. So our plan is to submit that before the end of uh, 2021 and then given a roughly two year review time that would give us registration at the end of 2023 with a launch in 2024. So tree fruit grape pests likely to be included in a submission for the two products. You know, stone fruit, uh, two spotted spider mite for Venerate as well as Grandivo, SWD on Grandivo, but it's probably gonna follow Venerate in terms of the sequence of submission. Some key pests for apples and pears would include San Jose scale, rosy apple aphid, apple maggot, woolly apple aphid with Venerate and uh, oblique banded leaf roller. And then Grandivo, we would probably also submit uh, plum cuculio when take mixed with surround. And then on grapes, both products are really quite good on grape berry moth and mealy bugs, which are a significant pest in Western grapes. So that brings us to the end. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Tim. Uh, we're gonna bring Greg Rogers up next, I think. Greg, can you share your screen? Take yourself off mute. Hey, yes, give me a minute here. Oh. I'm on, I'm, I'm, I'm across like three separate screens. So you have to bear with me for just a minute here. All right. So just for any of our US friends, you can see that you're a little bit ahead of us as far as having some of these biologicals registered as usual. All right, can, we, can, can you see the screen? Yes, go ahead. Okay, all right, excellent. So I'm gonna talk primarily about our LifeGuard product today. Um, and I guess, Tim, I should have gone before you to explain SAR so everyone got it, but uh, you know, we'll get there. Um, so we're gonna talk a little bit about induced resistances, which is how LifeGuard works and how we should best use it for disease control. Um, so yeah, just basically what is induced resistance? and talk about the products that we use and then how to use it best. So you think about induced resistance. Um, you, you, we all know plants have a certain level of resistance to attack both from insects and from, from disease. We're talking about disease here. Um, and so what would happen is under, the, un, under attack, they would upregulate pathways that, that produce protective proteins, um, maybe strengthen cell walls, that, that sort of activity. Um, most of these genes are actually sleeping, so they're quiescent. They don't do anything until the plant's under attack. Um, and then some of the, the microbial signals that are, that are given out when the, when, when the microbe attacks a plant actually turn on these, 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 these reactions. Um, and then when, once you turn it on in the whole plant, when you turn it on in a leaf, the whole plant is actually protected, and we call that induced resistance. A um, number of products in the market can do that. Um, and there's a number of ways to do it. Um, this is really a quick look at sort of the three separate ways that you can, can target induced resistance. Um, the first would be herbivore stress-induced resistance, which involves either insect feeding on the leaves or heat stress, cold stress, drought stress, all those kind of things where the plant upregulates certain, certain materials to protect itself. Um, and these are, this is usually mediated by jasmonic acid. There's a lot more in the background going on, but that's one of the primary molecules. Another way you can do this is through the root system. So some bacillus species like 
Um, the bacillus uh, subtilis and bacillus amelioliquefaciens can do this where they trigger induced systemic resistance um, just because they're near the root systems. They kind of trick the plant into thinking that there's nasty stuff down there. Um, and that's also jasmonic acid with a little ethylene thrown in. And then finally, the way LifeGuard works is systemic acquired resistance. And that's where when the pathogen lands on the leaf, um, it, in, in attacking that leaf, it actually puts out some molecular signals that the plant uses to recognize the attack and then respond to it. And it responds locally with, with usually like some necrotic tissue to try to try to wall off that, that pathogen. But at the same time, it sends a message throughout the entire plant one of those molecules being salicylic acid that basically says, hey guys, I'm under attack, get ready because there's more coming. And then the whole plant upregulates its defenses. So any one of these three ways can turn on the entire system in the plant. Um, and the result is the whole plant is resistant to um, attack by pathogens. All right, and so if you think about a normal plant under attack, certainly, you know, you, you, you get the pathogen landing, the plant goes, okay, I got to defend myself and it starts to upregulate these, these, these systems. Um, we know these systems can take a day or two to be fully active, and oftentimes with disease, a day or two is too much. So what we try to do with LifeGuard, with, with, with this, this, this priming, if you will, the plant defense activator priming, is we get in before the disease is there or while it's under control by, by another mode of action. And so when the pathogen, when the plant sees the pathogen again, it reacts much faster and there's much better protection. All right. So... That, that's what we're looking at. The product we're talking about today is actually LifeGuard, which is Bacillus mycoides isolate J, uh, discovered at Montana State, actually in Sacospora and uh, in, in sugar beets. Um, but we're going to talk about perennial crops today, primarily grapes. Um, so, so historically, grapes have not responded to SAR elicitors. Um, in talking to some of the researchers, you know, they tried some of the older ones like ActiGuard, and they just didn't see any activation. Um, I don't think that's true anymore, and I wonder if maybe it's because they weren't quite sure how to use these, because you have to approach this, 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 this use, these products a little differently than you'd approach, say, a, 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 you know, a, a Revis top or something like that, where you, we, where you get you know, instant control. Um, but definitely not all SAR compounds are created equal all the time. You'll see different, different compounds doing different things in different plants. Um, so anyhow, this is a fairly novel mode of action for use in grapes. Um, we have about six years of successful trials in New York on downy and powdery mildew, and now three years on botrytis. Um, we have four years of successful trials in Michigan on downy and powdery and black rot and phomopsis and a year on botrytis. So the cool thing about this mode of action is as you upregulate the plant, you're not protecting against just one disease. Uh, in the case of LifeGuard, downy mildew is kind of the home run disease for this product, but it's really good on powdery. It's pretty good on black rot. It's pretty good on phomopsis. And in botrytis, it looks to be nearly as good as the grower standards, like the Luna products and that sort of thing. So, um, you know, you get a lot more bang for your buck out of these SAR products than you think of if you're only targeting a single disease. So uh, LifeGuard um, use rate is 0.33 grams per liter of water. Um, the product is stable for two years if kept dry. I don't actually know what the Canadian label says but I know for a fact that it's good for two years if you keep it dry. Um, compatible with pretty much most fungicides and insecticides. The only things I'd warn you about are don't mix with antibiotics, which is not a big deal for grape growers, but is for apple growers when you talk about controlling fire blight and avoid PAA products like Oxidate because you'll fry those spores out. And without the spores to germinate, we can't trick the, uh, the plant into thinking it's, un it's under attack. Uh, safe to mix with coppers. Um, so in general, when you use these products, you want to think about there's a certain amount of time from when the product lands in the plant till when the plant has activated the internal mechanisms, right? So it takes about three hours after you spray LifeGuard for the plant to have basically internalized the reaction. And now everything's churning inside, right, as, as we produce proteins. Um, so we call that the rain fast time. So after three hours, I don't really care what happens to, to LifeGuard. It's, it's done its job. But it still takes about 24 hours after application for the SAR process to be fully activated, right? So to be fully ready to defend the plant. So you got to think about that as you spray these kind of products. You can't wait until the disease is going strong and then go, oh, we're going to save it with an SIR product. That's not how it works. We need to think of these more as protectant products. All right, so the use guidelines would be this. If possible, pick a cultivar or a variety with some resistance. In grapes, this is not as important. Actually, in perennials as a whole, this seems to be not as important. It seems to be much more important in vegetables. Um, spray before the infection is suspected or well disease is controlled by another effective product. 
All right. Our label actually says allow three to five days for product to fully induce the response. Um, again, we know it takes about 24 hours. Three to five days buys you a little bit of, of window to make sure you're protected. Um, and repeat on a regular basis, depending on what your spray patterns are. We know that the SIR uh, sort of upregulation lasts about 18 days in a plant with this product. So we like to get you on like a 14 day spray, spray interval, whether it's lifeguard alternated with something more something else effective and back to lifeguard or whether it's lifeguard straight, we wanna keep you in that, that protected mode. So no more than say about 14 days between applications. Um, so how do we use lifeguard? Well, you can use it alone, right? You can use a product alone, certainly, but just cause you can doesn't mean you probably ought to. Um, in a program with other effective products, this is the most common way that we use it. Um, and then in, in addition to a program, this is primarily bacterial disease in vegetables, but I can see it used in some really hard to control diseases in perennial crops as well. Uh, fire blight is kind of one of those things where you might, you might put this in with, with, with other products. So standalone, here we have some downy mildew data. Now this is a research vineyard, so you understand the downy mildew is, is off the charts. Um, and Zampro and Revis Top are sort of the grower standard and this is from New York. Um, you see Lifeguard by itself is doing just about as well as the grower standard, all right? So nice protection, super, but who wants to use a product all the way through the season, right? Because even with, even with conventional products, we like to rotate modes of action. And what happens when you rotate modes of action with a product like Life, Lifeguard, so in a program with other effective products, you can see here, this is from Michigan, and Lifeguard looks pretty good by itself, just about as good as the grower standard. But when you take pieces out of that grower standard and put Lifeguard in their place, you actually get better control of the disease, right? So not only are you protecting some of your single site mode of action, really expensive, you know, prone to resistance products, but you're also getting better control. So this is a way to sort of extend, you know, valuable products and improve control at the same time. Uh, similar general look in powdery mildew. And these are the two, these are the two products that two diseases in grapes that, that Lifeguard is currently registered for in Canada. Um, so again, you're getting two, two diseases out of this and you're getting pretty darn good control, which is kind of cool. Um, and then just the visual because who doesn't want to see a little powdery mildew tearing up grapes. Um, the cool thing about this, as I said, remember, because this upregulates the entire plant, it does more than just the disease you apply for, all right? So we just recently added black rot to the US label and you can see the grower standard is probably a better product, but when we alternate with the grower standard, we get pretty darn good control. And that means that, yeah, you can go out against other diseases and get a lot of help with black rot and a lot of help with Fomopsis, okay? So this is kind of a cool side, call it a side effect, right, of this product. And then one final tease um, that we've finally gotten some good data on both from New York um, and from Michigan is Botrytis. And this is really kind of exciting for us. Um, so there's Lifeguard by itself looking pretty good in, in combination with other products looking really good. But I'll point out that Black Rot, Fomopsis and Botrytis are not yet on the Canadian label. Um, we are actually working on a, a supplemental label for botrytis in the U.S. And when we revamp the label for Canada, we will add these diseases because all of our data is from Michigan and New York, and we can bridge to, to, to Canada. But in the meantime, if you look at that second blue line, second blue area, that's double nickel, which is Bacillus aminoliquefaciens, also available in Canada with botrytis on the label. So there you go. That's kind of my story. Um, so remember, pick a cultivar or variety with resistance, especially if you're in annual plants. Uh, using a program or in addition to a program containing other effective products, spray before infection is suspected or while it's under control with other effective products, allow three to five days for a product to fully induce the response, and then repeat regularly to maintain the response to keep your plants protected. There, and that's me. Thank you for your time. Wendy, I, I'm done. Thanks, Greg. Um, Claude, do you want to load up your presentation while I ask Greg a question, please? Uh, I noticed that there was a surfactant listed with um, Lifeguard. Is that required? It is not required. Um, Does it make it work better? So I would say surfactants almost always make products work better if you pick the right surfactant. Um, and I don't know how it is up in Canada, but in the U.S., we don't really get to pick surfactants too often. It's usually driven by the company selling the product for us. They kind of pair it with one of their surfactants. Um, in general, biologicals that contain spores or viruses, like virus particles, you'd want to avoid organosilicon spreaders because they tend to push the, the particles to the very edge of the leaf 
and they aren't as effective that way. So, but a, a regular, uh, regular good sticker is, 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 is a nice addition. Okay, thank you. Enjoy yep. your shot. Yeah, thanks. Okay, next up, Claude Dubois. Uh, hi, everyone. Good morning. Uh, can you uh, see the screen well, uh, Wendy? Yes. Okay, okay, good. So uh, for those who doesn't know, AF Global is a Canadian company specialized in the development of biopesticide. So this is the list of product register on grapes. So at first I'll be talking about Buran, which is a garlic extract. Uh, the best way to use that product is to adjust the rate according to your spray volume. So go with the percentage. Uh, the addition of a spreader, we were seeing great benefit out of it, especially for the activity of the product on foliage. Uh, the re-entry uh, is when the product is dry, so it can be just as quick as 30 minutes in certain condition. Um, the product is working by uh, drying out the spores and the germany that is found on the, the plant surface at the time of spraying. Um, the reason why I wanted to talk to you about uh, Buran this morning is that uh, at first, um, we uh, just go back in time. So we, we saw a great benefit of using a, a Buran with a low rate of Sirocco or meal stop. So just half a kilo of uh, Sirocco combined with Buran brings great activity on botrytis compared with the full rate uh, of, of the Sirocco. So that this is a, an interesting uh, way of using it. And also you can get the, to have the powdery activity. So, uh, but the reason why I, I, I'm talking about uh, mostly Buran is that we've seen uh, a combination that uh, has the great potential to hack as a curative uh, product. Uh, so, and this was found, found uh, a little bit by mistake. It was just by emptying out uh, a tank from a trial in a curbist area that we found out that great curative activity. And what we what we were able to see is that um, the cucurbits were just covered with heavily. It was late in the summer, covered by powdery. And uh, we know that Sirocco is, used, uh, is a good product for drying out the spores. So after that, we, uh, I did a spray of uh, comparing Sirocco with that combination. And after about four or five days, I was able to see the, uh, that, that the powdery regrowth was basically uh, uh, getting the powdery level just as uh, it would do, it would be in the untreated control uh, versus uh, that combination that keep, kept the leaf clean uh, up to frost with a single spray. And uh, in, that, in that picture, only half of the leaf uh, were sprayed with the combination compared with the other half that was untreated. So, and that picture was taken the 14 days uh, after the initial spray. So. Uh, this is uh, very exciting. Uh, so following that, we did some work in, in the greenhouse uh, just to narrow down our, our understanding about uh, that combination. So we, we did compare that with, uh, with Sirocco and did try to narrow down the, uh, uh, the, uh, the interaction. And we, we found out that the Buran in Cueva was driving a lot of that, but still we, we, we saw some edge of uh, adding pure spray on, on top of the equation. I know that uh, copper and oil are not known to be a good companion, but uh, this is something that we, uh, we want to investigate further. And, and I think there's uh, definitely a lot of potential for that. So for, uh, for the next season, our goal is to uh, generate data on grapes. Uh, and if there's uh, if there are growers uh, interested uh, looking at that uh, in, in a small block of their orchard, uh, of their vineyard, sorry. Uh, so all of the product are, are registered on grapes and uh, we, we will be uh, definitely happy to, uh, to support in any, any work uh, that could be done in addition to what we are planning. And uh, I encourage people to reach out to it with me and to discuss that further. So another product that we have registered on grapes is uh, Tivano. Tivano is a biofungicide, but it's also known for its activity, uh, its biostimulant activity. 
So we've seen over time, over multiple trial, that the product is uh, when the grapes are not thin. Uh, we only see that, that uh, on, on, on thin grapes. And we, we've seen that the product um, provides support to the plants to uh, support our yield. Uh, so restore the source and sink balance in the plant. And we've seen, we've seen consistent uh, increase of bricks in those conditions. Uh, so uh, Pat Johnson with Bartlett is doing a work on that. He has done, done work with Tivano to, uh, to establish the benefit on the bricks, but he's, uh, he's doing a, a project over three years now. Uh, so uh, he's only one year. He only had uh, done one year in his project, but he's seeing great potential of combining Tivano with a lot of microbial uh, biostimulant that he's assessing. So I think there's a lot of potential of combining uh, Tivano. We, uh, we know that based on the composition of the product, uh, there's a lot of uh, component can be used as energy source for the ba bacteria and also a, a protein. So uh, we've seen a lot of synergy between, between that and, and Pat Johnson will be the person to talk to in the, in the near future. So it's going to be exciting to see how it goes uh, uh, along the, the years. So that's uh, that cover up. Uh, I know you, uh, we have a tight schedule, so I don't know if I'm, uh, uh, if I'm out of my time, uh, Wendy. Uh, we really need to get Justine going because she has an appointment that she has to get to. So um, I will, everybody will have access to the video so they can send you questions by email. And I'm, I'm assuming Pat will cover something uh, as well. So thank you, Claude. And next up is Justine. Claude, stop sharing. Yeah, good. Um, can you hear me okay? Yep. All right. And can you see my slides? Yes. Great. Okay. Good morning, everyone. Uh, so I'm going to uh, cover today some research that we've done here in New York on inoculating vineyards to form more mycorrhizae. So what are mycorrhizae? Well, they are a close relationship between a fungal organism and a root system. And this is a symbiotic relationship in that it helps both the fungus and the root system. And most plants on the surface of this planet actually form these. There's a few different kinds of, uh, of mycorrhizae, but about 80% um, form these, uh, the types of mycorrhizae that we do have in grapevines as well. This is an old relationship uh, evolved about 400 to 450 million years ago. And what does the vine get out of it? The vine gets increased nutrition, phosphorus, nitrogen, potassium, that sort of thing. And the fungus gets carbon that it needs to grow. So how does this actually work? Well, a root sends out a chemical signal that the uh, fungal spore responds to, or excuse me, the fungus responds to. So what happens is that once the fungus pursues that chemical signal, it forms a spore and then uh, these what are called extra radical hyphae. And so these are long uh, filaments that come from the spore and then eventually grow into the cortical cells in the root system. We then refer to them as, as intra radical hyphae. And then once into the root, they form these vesicles and arbuscules. So arbuscules are sites where nutrient exchange actually happens between the fungus and the vine. And vesicles are where some of those nutrients are actually stored for later use. So this is a, a representation from a South African wine magazine. You can see these are not grape vines, so this is not a real photo. Um, but the idea is that you end up with these hyphae forming essentially a functional root system for the plant. They're not roots, but they act like roots. So they can access water, they can access um, the different nutrients, uh, and then the vine is supposed to grow bigger and be more resilient to both uh, biotic and abiotic stress. So there's been a lot of work on mycorrhizae, not necessarily in grapevines, but in many other 
crop plants. And they have a significant number of benefits in many cases. So I already mentioned plant growth, uh, resistance to abiotic and biotic stresses. So we're talking about for biotic diseases, pests, that sort of thing, for abiotic heat, drought, again, because of that increase in, in what is essentially a functional root system. Uh, they increase the soil water holding capacity, um, just again, due to the hyphae, and then uh, have a significant impact on uh, what we consider to be soil health as well. So again, this has been proven in many other crops. There is some work that's been uh, done in grapes, but the results aren't very clear at this point. So my group started working on this uh, at the behest of the growers here in the Finger Lakes region of New York, is they were applying, a, a few of them were applying some different products. And so they came and asked me to start working on them. And, and I was, to be honest, kind of hesitant. But I'll tell you now, several years later, I'm glad I did because it's worked out uh, reasonably well. So the research questions we were asking, um, can commercial inoculants successfully colonize grapevine roots and improve grapevine health? And uh, is root morphology of grapevine shaped by this AMF colonization? So that's the arbuscular mycorrhizal fungi. And so it's basically the mycorrhizae. So we've done a few different experiments on this that I'm going to touch on. Uh, two different field experiments. One uh, was Pinot Noir on 3309. Uh, the second was Riesling on 3309C and on SO4. And then we did a greenhouse experiment too, where we compared Cabernet Sauvignon on 3309 to Cabernet Sauvignon on its own roots with some of these different inoculants. And these are the different products that we use. These are not the only ones available. Um, what we did is we went through the literature and chose some that, complain, that contained the fungus, fungus species in glomus um, because they've been proven in grapevines and in other plants to have a positive effect. And so this is the list that we came up with. You'll see that all of these products have different uh, types of mycorrhizae. And some of them have different additions as well. So if you look at number one, the Bigfoot concentrate, it's got four species of endomycorrhizae, also nitrogen, uh, phosphorus, potassium, humic acids, uh, biochar, and worm castings. So an important thing to remember is when I show you some of these results, we're not really comparing apples to apples um, because of these different, uh, the different products and, and what they have in them. So the application rates, this is what's listed on the label. Uh, you can see that, that it's not very clear how you would apply these in vineyards, right? It's the number of teaspoons per hole or per plant. So what we did was two things. If um, it was easily soluble, we mixed it in water. And so we just said, okay, if it's this number of teaspoons per plant, then we calculated up on a per vine basis for a portion of the vineyard, mixed it into water and, and applied it that way, just sprayed it at the base of the, of the vines in what would be usually your, your herbicide strip. Uh, if we were unsure, then what we usually did was we dug a, a tiny trench with a, with a hoe, you know, like no more than an inch deep, and then sprinkled some of the product in there and then just waited for the rain. Um, to come and spread that through the, the root system. So we weren't very precise in how we were applying it, uh, but when we did the calculations, we were following these, these guidelines somewhat. Uh, the cost per acre here, um, sorry, this is in American dollars and on nine by six foot spacing. So you can see the cost uh, ranges from as low as $160 per acre if you follow the label up to $478 per label. So a few uh, cool pictures of, of mycorrhizae. So there's different parts to the mycorrhizae as I talked about. Um, there's the hyphae, both extra radical and intra radical. Uh, and when they're extra radical, those are the ones that are essentially acting like a root system, again, for the vines. Uh, our buscules over here on the, on the left, these are the structures that are responsible for nutrient exchange between the root and the fungus. 
And uh, the vesicles over here, these uh, round structures, those are responsible for storage of the nutrients. And so this is an image of, uh, of a Pinot Noir root. Um, these darker lines here, these are the intraradical hyphae all through the root. And these round structures here are vesicles and um, sort of the more oblong structures are our buscules here. And another Pinot Noir root, I just want to show you uh, the extra radical hyphae and what they look like when they're coming uh, out of the root. So again, basically adding more essentially functional root area uh, to the vine. So uh, I'm gonna show you a few results from our greenhouse experiment and from our field experiments. Um, for these, we basically focused on, on two different things. Uh, one was looking at the root system. So we would sample roots, stain them, and under a microscope count these different structures on a per centimeter basis of the root so that we could uh, develop this, met, this AMF colonization rate uh, number. So we could quantify what proportion of the root system was actually colonized by mycorrhizae. Uh, the other thing we focused on was uh, vine nutrition and vine size. So in the greenhouse experiment, if you remember, I said we compared 3309C uh, grafted to Cabernet Sauvignon to Cabernet Sauvignon on its own roots. So in this graph, uh, the blue bars are 3309C and the orange bars are Cabernet Sauvignon. So interestingly, what we found is that Cabernet Sauvignon uh, even in the control treatment had greater uh, root colonization by mycorrhizae compared to 3309. And we've seen this again in some of our other um, studies that we've been looking at is that it seems that there is a genetic difference um, in the ability of different rootstocks to uh, form these mycorrhizal associations. And so this is something we're going to be looking at in the future. So uh, across the x-axis here, we have uh, control and then products one through five. Again, blue is 3309 and orange is the own rooted Cabernet Sauvignon. And you can see that with these products, we have a significant increase in the colonization rate. So for 3309C, we go from just above 60% up to a little above 70%. And for own rooted, we go from about 67% up to around 87% of the root system being colonized. So, I, and I should have mentioned uh, in this experiment, this was uh, in soil that we um, brought in from the campus farm. So it was not sterilized in what I'm showing you. And it is reasonably low in, in phosphorus as it are all the soils around us in this region. And uh, my apologies for the colors changing here. This is from the same experiment. Uh, so in this graph, Cabernet Sauvignon on its own roots is in yellow and on 3309 is in green. And this is total nitrogen content in the leaves. And again, you can see that we had a pretty significant increase. Uh, the own rooted went from about 1.7% up to close to 2.1% as the mean, uh, 3309 went from 1.7 up to about a little above 1.9%. Uh, so again, significant increase in nitrogen. This is dry matter allocation. So the top portion of this graph is the shoot dry weight. The lower portion of this graph is the root dry weight. Uh, yellow bars are capsulum its own roots and blue is Cab Sauvon 3309. And we've got some pretty big increases here. So for example, Cab Sauvon 3309, the root system in our control was about six grams, uh, increases to about 12 grams uh, with product five here. Uh, own rooted, the difference wasn't, wasn't as great because the own root started uh, bigger. And so we had an increase of about three grams um, for the root system. Uh, when we look at the shoot system for 3309, we went from a little less than two grams up to greater than four grams of dry weight for the root system, or excuse me, for the shoots, and uh, a little less of an increase in own rooted, but just statistically significant. And what does this look like? Uh, on the left here, we have Cadso own rooted 
um, with some of the different products. On the right is Cabernet Sauvignon on 3309. And you can see those root systems are considerably bigger. So we also worked in this study with sterilized soil. And we found that when we sterilized the soil, we essentially had no mycorrhizae and very poor growth. So that does tell us that, at least here in the Finger Lakes, we do have a, a base amount of, this, uh, of these funguses or fungi that can colonize the roots. So moving on to the field. Uh, so this is Pinot Noir at the commercial vineyard on 3309. And in this graph, we've divided up the uh, proportion of roots that are colonized by vesicles, arbuscules, and the hyphae. So again, vesicles are the storage units for the nutrients. And arbuscules are uh, the sites of, of nutrient exchange. And so uh, for vesicles, you can see we go from about 18% uh, of roots colonized up to in product five, maybe about 23%. Our buscules have somewhat of a similar increase and hyphae, we grow, go from about 58% up to a little greater than, than 70%. So we were pleasantly surprised to find after we had done the greenhouse study that when we tried this in a commercial setting in the vineyard, it did have a significant impact on the colonization of the roots. We saw the same thing uh, working with Riesling. Um, uh, this is the graph for 3309. SO4 looked very uh, similar as well. Uh, in this graph, the vesicles are blue, our buscules are green, and hyphae are orange. In 3309, we didn't try all the different products. We just tried um, a few of them. And you can see again, statistically, a significant increase in the colonization by each of these three different sets of, of structures. So how did this impact the, uh, the nutrients in the field? So this is uh, back to Pinot Noir on 3309. On the x-axis here, we have the control, product one, two, three, and five. Uh, and the y-axis is the nutrient content. Phosphorus is the red bars. And so um, because we've got everything on the same y-axis here, this doesn't look very statistically significant, but it is. It's highly significant. Uh, that's one of the things that these mycorrhizal associations are specifically known for is being able to increase phosphorus, particularly in situations like we're in here where we're on a low phosphorus soil. So phosphorus increased. Uh, nitrogen, uh, you can see it was low, definitely, but there is a statistically significant uh, increase. Same thing with magnesium, which is uh, in orange here, uh, potassium, which is in blue, and calcium, which is in, in yellow. So when we look at the different macro and micronutrients, in most cases, we see a positive impact um, that, that is worth investigating further in the hopes that we may be able to use some of these inoculants as a, a replacement or at least a partial replacement for um, some of the commercial fertilizers that we're using. So briefly, in summary, um, all of the inoculants that we worked with increased root length colonization of, of mycorrhizae in both the greenhouse and the vineyard, some certainly more than others. But again, we have to be careful because, for example, product five always looked better than product four, but product four contained only the endomycorrhizae and clay and product five had nitrogen, uh, phosphorus, and potassium added to that as well. Um, but all of the different products uh, worked. They positively impacted nutrient uptake and biomass in the greenhouse. We haven't yet looked at uh, vine biomass in the field. Our study suggests that uh, commercial arbuscular mycorrhizal fungal inoculants may potentially be an alternative to uh, chemical fertilizers. Uh, am I recommending them at this time? 
The answer to that is no. I think it's a little premature, uh, but I do think it is worth starting to experiment with, with some of these um, on a few rows or on a block. Uh, the costs are high. And I think the question is, is this financially going to be worth it to growers? So again, these are the uh, different products that, that I worked with. Uh, if you try them out, let me know. I'm interested in hearing um, how they, they work for you. I should mention, uh, and should have mentioned earlier, the differences that we see out in the field are not visible to the eye. When you walk through the vineyard, to me, it didn't look like anything was different at all. It was when we actually did the analysis of the roots or the analysis of the leaf blade nutrients that we saw some of these differences. And uh, with that, um, if I can, I can answer questions. I don't know what if Wendy had that in mind for now or if we're going to wait. I think we'll open it up to some questions now, knowing that uh, you have to head out and I don't know if Greg's still on. If there are any questions from the growers, um, I guess one of them would be, and I think Matt and Yauk will probably have this question as far as uh, which species are involved in the mycorrhizae that you used versus the ones that are commercially available here? Uh, I'm sorry, I don't, I don't have a good feeling for what's commercially available. I know some of these products are available in Ontario, but I'm not sure specifically which ones. I will say from, uh, from going through the academic literature quite thoroughly, I would say look for labels that contain glomus species, because in grapevines, those have been well proven to have a positive impact on rootland colonization. Okay, Matt or Yelk, do you have any comments? Sure, um, we've been playing with Myco Apply, but it's not yet commercially available for this year. We're waiting on a uh, different formulation. So Yelk has BioCult that I think he's gonna speak on and that'll be the one that's commercially available for, for this year. And I'm not sure uh, Yelk will be able to speak better to that. Yeah, we've got, um, we don't have an awful lot of product that we brought in this year, uh, but um, like Matt said, the, um, um, we, do have, we do have some for commercial and we're doing an awful lot of uh, demonstration trials this year um, out in the field. So um, uh, be in touch with us, but we'll, we'll discuss that a little bit more later. Uh, there's been a lot, an awful lot of reclassification too of all the Gloma spe species. Uh, also the genus Glomus has been changing rapidly um, so I'll touch on that too on my presentation. Okay. Um, I have a quick question for. Go for Wendy. it. Uh, so I enjoyed your presentation, Justine. I was just wondering, did you see any differences? Did you guys record any differences in uh, growth of the vines between the different treatments? Did you see any differences there? So yes, we did in the greenhouse, and they're substantial. Um, so. Uh, you know, the root system for on um, 3309, Capsov on 3309 uh, doubled in, in dry weight, um, shoots not quite, a little less, uh, but we didn't record uh, growth differences in the field yet. So we have a couple of um, proposals out there that we're hoping are funded so that we can do. Well, thanks. Do you know of any interactions between pesticide use and um, effects on mycorrhizae, anybody? Or herbicides, that would be interesting. Yeah. I don't know of anything, I'll, I'll, I'll also say, um, so part of this, the grant that funded this work, we worked with seven different growers and just helped them trial it. So sort of a row here and then compared to, to a row that was unsprayed. And they had a range of different undervine management strategies. Some were herbicide, one was cultivation, some were uh, permanent fescue under the vines. And in all of those, we still saw an increase in root length colonization. I was particularly concerned about the undervine cover crop um, strips and whether we were going to, uh, to be able to basically wash those fungal spores down far enough to actually get to the roots because we know that that 
vine roots grow deeper in that situation. Um, and so I don't have enough information to compare those under vine management strategies, but I will say in all of them, we still did see a positive increase in rootland colonization. Okay, another question. Have you seen any response as far as virus to, has there been any effect on virus expression with mycorrhizae? I don't have any information to, uh, to comment on that. We, we have a lot of virus here, <laughs> for sure. It's something that we could look into, um, but I don't have any information at this time, I'm sorry. So, and I mean, the, the literature suggests that it may increase uh, resistance to insects and diseases. I don't know whether that's primarily in the roots or whether it's above ground, but be interesting to look at that as well. Yeah, so some of it is above ground um, and some of this, these papers have been coming out of uh, Europe. So we're hopeful. And, you know, as I said, when the growers first asked me to work on this, I really wasn't super keen, but now I'm finding this really interesting. <laughs> so hoping we get more funding to, to keep going on this because there's just so many questions. I realized that, that the work I showed you today is just, just a short introduction to, I think, some of the possibilities here. So I'm assuming that Yelk will be covering um, application methods and that kind of stuff? Yeah, um, I will, Wendy. And um, I've also got a compatibility chart on a lot of the chemistries that are uh, being used. So uh, that's an ongoing document, but can also uh, discuss that. OK. Yeah. Well, thank you very much for uh, addressing us. Um, if anybody has questions, you can either email Justine directly or email Catherine or me and we will get back to you. Thank you very much. Do you guys wanna take a, what's the feeling as far as taking a break? Do you wanna take a break or keep on going? Everybody, do we need a break? Wendy, can we ask questions of previous speakers at this yes. point? Yes. Oh, okay. I'd like to ask uh, Tim Johnson a question on uh, Grandivo. Uh, on uh, apples for plum curculio, you mentioned a, a combination of uh, Grandivo and surround. Uh, I don't like the work of applying surround. Uh, what's doing the heavy, heavy lifting on that? The Grandivo or the surround? I don't see Tim on right now. He had another oh. call as well. Um, but I think his email is on the, is on the uh, PowerPoint. And if not, I, it's probably in the mail out that I sent to you. So you should be able to pick it up there. Okay. And another question is Michael from BioWorks. No, on? he's gone too. Okay. I'll deal Sorry. with that. Thanks. Well, the challenge was everybody's schedules are difficult to fit into. So, all right, then uh, let's get on with uh, Tom Lowry please, if you can share your screen, Tom. He was here. Yeah, here. I need you to unmute, Tom. Uh -huh. Tom Lowry, are you there? I'm here, Wendy. If you're ready, we are. I'm ready to go. Okay, let's share your screen then. Well, I don't have anything to show. I'm not doing a slideshow. You gave okay. me the option of uh, just a presentation or a slide presentation. So I'm just gonna cover uh, we'll leave your smiling face up there with the glass of uh, wine. Um, I'm going to talk about uh, specifically the control options uh, may, mostly employed here in, in the West in BC. But I want to start off, follow up with some of the previous presenters. And I'm so pleased to see the effort to register products uh, for use in Canada. And we certainly need a lot of new materials, particularly those with uh, different modes of action. So uh, 
following up, starting first of all with the conventional growers, if we look at some of the problems that uh, we have to overcome, they're the obvious ones with uh, resistance is always a threat. Uh, they're broad spectrum. So a lot of the ones we have, they're, they're really hard on the beneficial insects. So, uh, some of them like neonics face export restrictions. You have to be careful if you're exporting to Europe. And then we have seen with uh, particularly neonics, but also pyrethroids that we get resurgence in some pests. So uh, limited options. If we look at even conventional you look at, uh, I'll use for an example, uh, leaf hoppers on grapes in Canada. It looks like we have a number of products, but five of them are neonics. The option, the main option really is only uh, two pyrethroids and the organic um, uh, pyrethrum, uh, pyganic. So really both of them broad spectrum, the, we need, we need options there. So part of the project that I have funded, a five-year project through the CGCN, the Canadian Grapevine uh, Certification Network and uh, Agriculture and Agri-Food Canada is to look at alternatives uh, with not only organics, but conventional products as well. So we have uh, ability to do lab bioassays to start with and then we can take that to the field either at our own site or working closely with growers. So we're hoping to contribute to new, uh, particularly insecticides suiting organics, but also conventional ones that are in from new classes, new modes of action, because uh, I think relying on more and more neonics is uh, potentially gonna lead to a problem. So, what alternatives should we be looking at? I've uh, done some work in the past, isolated a Bavaria bassiana uh, strain that is more efficacious against cutworm. It was isolated from cutworm. Uh, the work was done to, the, the hypothesis was that collecting a, a local strain would be more adapted to our cooler climate. So these are climbing cutworm that uh, overwinter is partly grown larvae and they attack the buds in the spring. The uh, commercially available Bavaria bassiana materials, uh, first of all, they were collected, one of them I know was collected in Florida. They were produced under very high temperatures so you get lots of volume, but they're not very well adapted. These two isolates that I have, uh, the one we've uh, uh, nicknamed cutworm killer because it came from cutworm, <laughs> we did the lab work to show they were more effective, uh, particularly at, at cold temperatures against cutworm. Uh, we've shared them and uh, Deb Henderson at Kwantlen University College in the Fraser Valley, she's been working on uh, expanding that, seeing if uh, developing uh, towards a commercial uh, product. So have to see how far we are along with that, but that's uh, the sort of areas that we're more interested in. Um, you need to, when you move to organic production in Canada, if we have problems registering uh, products for uh, conventional uh, pest control in Canada, and that's very difficult. A lot of companies, we've been after a material like uh, Buprofezin, uh, Applaud is one of the trade names. We've been after that for years and years and we, we can't bring it to Canada. The, the company's not interested. When you then go down to the organic sector, it becomes even more difficult. So uh, I would encourage all the companies, uh, please consider trying to get your products into Canada for conventional or organic. Uh, the one thing I want to talk about is organic. You really need to layer things. And organic growers understand this. You need to start with uh, a better understanding of the pest. You also have to consider how you uh, incorporate uh, practices such as uh, uh, the one I'll talk about. I've done a lot of work on early season leaf removal. And uh, more and more growers are doing that uh, here in BC, where generally around uh, post bloom, petal fall, uh, 
can go in and take strip leaves off up to the second uh, fruit cluster. There is almost no effect on yield or uh, growth of the vines, but you can get, if you time it right, you can get about 70% reduction in leafhopper numbers. But it is also taking down the numbers of things like scale insects, the, nit, the crawlers, the nymphs at that time would go on to these basal leaves. Uh, things like it probably has an effect on Arrhenium mite, haven't looked into that too much, but there are secondary effects as well. It opens up the canopy and allows uh, fungicides to get in there. It also exposes the fruit to more light and air, and that thickens the cuticle and the wax uh, coating. And it does a very good job, for example, out here, we have a drier climate. Uh, it'd be particularly useful in Ontario, I would think, with the uh, humid, extra humidity there. But here, it's very effective for uh, control of things like bunch rots. But it also reduces powdery mildew and other diseases as well. So we did a lot of work on that. It's still ongoing. Kevin Usher's been looking now at effects on uh, wine quality. Uh, and there's some economics as well. But you can do it by machine early season. And a lot of growers do this later in the season. We're just suggesting it's probably more effective to do this early. We see fewer problems too with uh, burning or any scalding of the fruit because they're exposed early. The, as I mentioned, they get a thicker cuticle and wax layer. So there's, we really don't see the damage. There is an uh, improvement in the fruit quality as well for red cultivars with that extra exposure. The fruits uh, has a little more color to it. Uh, so uh, that's, a, that's a consideration that you don't just look at coming in and uh, manage a pest with a particular uh, spray product. You have to incorporate these spray products into a complete program. Uh, another important issue is the health of the vines. You want to avoid excessive uh, fertility. Uh, a lot of insect pests love that uh, luscious nature, the thick canopies. You don't want to stress them too much either. So fortunately, the, the best conditions for producing high quality wine is also the, the sweet spot where you want to be to uh, uh, suppress uh, diseases and insect pests. Uh, talking about sprays that, uh, you know, moving on from the the, the sort of conventional sprays into things like microbials. Uh, one of the things I've worked with a long time, I've actually, and I'm a fan on and off for over 25 years, I've worked with uh, oil, uh, oil sprays on various crops, including grapes. Um, and there are several ways that you can get uh, benefits from using oils. So we're looking at either dormant sprays, uh, foliar sprays, or uh, using oil generally at uh, half a percent as a, a, a boost for uh, conventional or organic materials. Uh, some of those, uh, it's very beneficial to add a little bit of oil to that, acting as a, a natural spreader, uh, spreader sticker that helps the effectiveness. So out here, more and more oil is being used um, for organics and that's great to have the companies on side. One of the things we need is a little more work for the application methods. And a lot of this is extension to growers. Uh, you can't put an oil on the same way you uh, put some of your pesticides. It has to coat the insect. You're basically smothering the insect. So you need high volumes, you need to direct your nozzles, use the proper nozzles, and it, uh, timing is important if, it, if you can work it. It's, it's, it's difficult. We've done some work with mealybug uh, and uh, scale crawlers trying to time them when you have different species. So we in uh, BC and in Ontario, we have the cottony vine scale, European fruit lacanium scale, and then the great mealybug. And they all have slightly different uh, timing for the crawlers. And the uh, mealybug has two generations. So you're getting a second generation of crawlers. So the, the oils though are used widely and uh, they have great potential, uh, one or two applications, maybe three per year 
for control of leaf hoppers, uh, even for these uh, mealybug scale, various other things. So we're looking at uh, growers have, we've trialed this even at 2% under high temperatures. We have pretty intense light here in BC, even at slightly higher temperatures, some growers we've gotten away with a 2% uh, oil spray. Uh, I'd be very careful with that. And of course you have to be careful with compatibility, avoid anything with uh, sulfur uh, that, uh, that, that, that can be very damaging. But otherwise these new highly purified oils are very safe. So a lot of work on timing, basically extension, but oils are, uh, should be part of a program. Uh, moving on from that, we're really looking at a number of strategies that uh, work that I've done. I mentioned the early season removal of basal leaves. Another area that uh, you have to look at the ecology of the vineyard and look at the sort of the context. What is your pest complex? Where does uh, a specific practice work and where doesn't it work? So if you have uh, multiple pests, you're gonna have to spray anyway, maybe investing a lot of time and money uh, in an effort to control one pest uh, might not be uh, smart economically that you're better if a pesticide is going to do uh, a complex of pests, you might be better with that approach. So uh, an example for looking at the sort of the agro ecosystem, we've had very good luck controlling climbing cutworm pests uh, using uh, increased uh, plant species diversity. So having more broadleaf plants in the vineyard, uh, either in the vine row, in the case of uh, winter annual mustards like shepherd's purse, it is very effective. You can get almost uh, complete control of uh, most cutworm species that we have, the native species, uh, with uh, uh, shepherd's purse. Now, a little side note, we did a lot of lab work uh, shepherd's purse is actually toxic to our native species of climbing cutworm, and we have a complex of them, mainly five major ones, but we've collected actually 20 some species of climbing cutworm. The native ones, they like shepherd's purse, they prefer it over most other plants, but it actually is toxic to them. So they, it, it draws them in and, and it uh, does actually kill them. It's an interesting thing in lab work. They can survive on it up to the third instar, but then they will die after that. If you take them and move them as fifth instar right on to shepherd's purse, they die right away. So it's an interesting change in their physiology as they grow. Unfortunately, a new invasive pest, the um, uh, European, uh, the lesser uh, yellow underwing moth is, uh, not uh, killed by shepherd's purse. So that's a, that's a new invasive pest. We don't know how bad it's gonna get here in BC. Fortunately, it's only on the heavier soils. So there's some problems with getting the, 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 the vegetation, but some of the growers, you, you have to adjust your irrigation in some cases. If you're on the really sandy, like beach sand down in the Black Sage area in uh, South Okanagan, it's hard to get some of the broadleaf plants in there. But generally we found that even getting 10% mixture of broadleaf plants in the spring will give very effective uh, reduction in uh, uh, bud damage caused by these climbing cutworm species. So that's an area that uh, can also be incorporated into organic production. And we have a lot of growers working on either what we found to be useful plants or uh, striking out on their own, trying a number of different things. So the, the increased plant species diversity also increases the uh, populations of the beneficial insects, predators, and parasites. We looked at uh, specific anagris uh, egg parasites, little tiny wasps, uh, mimarid wasps that attack the parasitize the eggs of leafhoppers, and those were increased with greater uh, uh, plant species diversity, greater preponderance of broadleaf plants in the vineyard. Uh, 
another, the last area I'm going to talk about, I've done a lot of work on leafhopper antifeedants and uh, some interesting results from the lab and have taken it to the field. Uh, the tested a large number of uh, fungicides and then a large number of surfactants, uh, plant uh, essential oils, formulated plant essential oils, all kinds of things. And so this all started from, we were actually going to conduct a field trial in a grower commercial field and had uh, the plots uh, staked out, everything ready to go and the leaf hoppers disappeared. And this was uh, quite some time ago. And um, what, uh, so we investigated and found out that uh, the, some of the fungicides, the strobal urine fungicides were very uh, repellent, antifeedant to leafhoppers, both the nymphs and the adults. And you could get, uh, for example, the fungicide pristine, uh, even in the field, you could get over 95% reduction in uh, leafhopper uh, populations in uh, just using uh, those strobil urine fungicide. Uh, also, and we're not certain exactly if it's the fungicide active or if it's the surfactants, because some of the surfactants turn out, the organosilicone surfactants turn out to be highly uh, deterrent uh, to leafhopper feeding as well. So um, uh, we did initial work with Silgard and we found some that are even more effective. And again, some of that, they, we've taken this to the field and uh, some of them work quite well. So uh, the, the field antifeedance uh, for leafhoppers seems to have some promise, but for other insect pests, uh, perhaps not, uh, it's perhaps limited. But you really need to look at building uh, a program. And I sent out to growers recently uh, a, a, a layered, a stratified program for leafhopper management that uh, puts in place the timing for all the different uh, activities or actions that you could take. And incorporated in that, of course, is an understanding of the biology of the pests. So organic uh, management in Canada is faced uh, with difficulties getting products on the market that growers can use. There's uh, increased knowledge required about the pest biology, uh, the timing of the various actions that uh, need to be taken. And uh, then uh, in summary, I'd like to encourage the industry uh, various chemical company industries uh, to please consider and hopefully I'll be reaching out to some industry members in the near future because we are running some trials with uh, greenhouse trials, field trials and these uh, lab bioassays looking for uh, new effective materials. So I'm going to end it with that and uh, I'm just under my half hour so thank you very much. Wendy back to you. Okay. Does anybody have any questions for Tom? I have lots, but I want the growers to ask first. I have one. Go for if it. If I might. Uh, on yep. your antifeedants, Tom, uh, have you tried any uh, organic uh, surfactants? Have they been tested? Uh, we have. Uh, we've tested an organic. Uh, there's some of the there, there are differences in the different uh, organic uh, organizations of uh, which ones are acceptable and which ones aren't, but there are actually some organosilicone surfactants that are considered uh, okay for organic. And uh, there's one or two of those that were highly effective. So that's uh, an area that we're interested in. Uh, the, the ones we've just looked at just finished this work up just uh, this, this last fall. So it's all brand new, but some of the work we, we did years ago on Silgard, for example, but the new organic ones, um, they, they, that's something we want to follow up with a field trial before we recommend it to growers. But there are some, yes, that are uh, very effective. Thank you. Anybody else? Okay, just for clarification for our growers, 
Uh, potato leaf hopper is not an issue for you. You're when you're talking leaf hoppers, you're talking the stippling ones, right, Tom? Yes, uh, you do have. We don't have the potato leaf hopper here. You do have potato leaf hopper in Ontario and back east, uh, of course, in the states as well. Uh, farther south, it's a problem earlier in the season. In Ontario, it doesn't overwinter, so it blows up from the Gulf Coast every year. So generally, it arrives late. It does cause uh, feeding damage in that it feeds not only on the leaf material, but more on the veins. It's more of a, a phloem feeder, and it does inject a toxin. So it's, it's more serious than the stippling, the leaf hoppers that just cause the stippling on the leaves of grapes. You need very high populations. The threshold is quite high for the ones that cause the stippling. But uh, it, it, you can get uh, serious levels of damage for, from the, the ones that cause the stippling as well. Uh, I'm trying to figure out what, Danielle, can you just go off mute and ask your question, please? Oh, she's asking about pottery mildew. Um, so that's not a Tom question. Uh, okay, so oils. I know I, I could just imagine all my growers ears perking up when you mentioned oils and mealybug and scale. Yep. Um, we've been notoriously, I've had a notoriously difficult time in figuring out when to start these oil treatments uh, in order to manage the mealybug <clears throat> because um, it's, it's hard to know when they're, they're moving out to be susceptible and getting the spray under the bark and old vines, which is where we find most of our mealybugs is very difficult. So could you comment a little bit more on that, please? Well, there's, there's two windows, uh, the dormant spray, and uh, that is, uh, there's a bigger window there. You don't have to time it. You just need to get that on before. And you can go quite late on a, a, a delayed dormant spray will work as well. But you're right. Uh, it's difficult when you have lots of bark and trying to get down under there uh, to get at the mealybugs. They tend to really want to get under the bark. We found that more of the soft scale uh, the uh, cottony vine scale, they'll actually lay on the previous years or the overwintering females will stay on the, uh, the overwintering on the last year's wood. So they're a little more exposed, but the mealybug really like to get down under the bark with their, their masses. And they do have that cottony mass that protects them. So you can only get from our work, you can get maybe you can get 50% reduction and you can get higher with the dormant spray, but a lot of the dormant spray with oil is also going after other things as well. So as a general contribution to cleaning up, uh, dormant spray is a good start. Uh, oils are relatively cheap. The next time, uh, next target window is the crawler stage when they're more exposed, smaller, they haven't really settled yet. Uh, that is a little more difficult because we need to build up better information. Uh, it's almost site by site out here. We have so much variation due to mountains and, and uh, aspect and various things that the temperature can be quite variable. It's a little more uniform, I would think, in Ontario. But even there, if you're at the lower bench versus the upper bench, or you know, it can vary quite a bit. So we need to, need to figure out the timing for mealybugs specifically, uh, exactly when those are. But there are a couple of windows when you can uh, use oil and, and target hit those, those crawlers. Uh, it will work when they're a little bit bigger, but uh, the crawler stage is, is uh, more vulnerable. So that, that would be your two, your periods of timing. And uh, Wendy, uh, you've got some work to do <laughs> to figure out the best timing. Uh, I'm trying to do some out here. We've been uh, with using uh, uh, sticky tape uh, traps, trying to figure out the, the best timing. I have a thesis student who's trying to work on looking at degree day accumulation and crawler emergence for both scale and, and mealybug. But just uh, thinking about the scale, that's a point where 
uh, growers in areas in vineyards where they do have scale problems, they can remove a lot of that, um, a lot of those egg masses if they selectively prune out and remove this, any canes that have scale on them? Do they have to be burned or can they just chop them? Uh, that's a good question. I am not aware of anyone really um, doing, if you, if you do it early enough, those, a lot of them should dry out. Um, I, I don't have any information on how important that is to get rid of the overwintering scale with, uh, you know, whether it's important to uh, burn those or, or, or just chipping them and early enough if the wood's going to dry out. It does take a while before those start moving. So if you prune that wood out early and leave it lying around, I think it would uh, uh, negatively impact the, the, the overwintered scale quite a bit. But I honestly can't tell you if, if it's uh, uh, controlling them that much if you bother to do the, the cleanup or just chipping's okay. Uh, speaking of that, though, one other sideline I just want to quickly mention, there is, you have to be careful the, as much as possible, especially if you're organic, there is a, a, a high level of biocontrol. We've been doing some work on uh, parasites of mealybug and scale, and uh, naturally, there's a very, very high rate. So we're looking at over 90%, uh, some cases over 95% parasitism of uh of the cottony vine scale here in BC, and I'm sure it's the same in Ontario. So for organic growers, again, if we can get some of these selective materials to complement the natural biocontrol, uh, that, that would really be beneficial. Um, so thinking cover crops, are there any cover crops that we could use that might um, promote the beneficials that my, I, I know there are some beetle species that can be predatory on mealybugs and that kind of thing. Is there anything we could do with cover crops? And do they have to be below vine or is just being in the row middle going to do the job? There, it's, it's, uh, it's, a, it's a difficult mix because you have uh, the impact of the pesticides that has to be considered. So if uh, Taking, assuming that you've, you're using materials that are softer on beneficials, uh, having a general uh, mix, it gets back to the work we did with the uh, looking at, just to give you very quickly a bit of background, we started off with 98 uh, sites, study sites in commercial vineyards, where we went in three times a year, looked at the vegetation uh, around the vineyard, uh, our, in the vine row, in the drive row, and did that three times a year where we were looking at spe uh, specific plant species, but also uh, compositions, the species composition, broadleaf plants, but also some specific ones we knew were beneficial. Uh, short, very uh, brief summary was that we saw more beneficials uh, with greater plant species diversity. We used to encourage out here having, this is a long time ago, either uh, people, the wood growers would till or they would have, try to maintain grass only. And we actually found that uh, with, for a lot of things like cutworm, for example, the worst problem uh, we find were tilled and grass only plantings uh, or ground cover. So, uh, once you get more plant species diversity. So it's, that is very specific to the soil type, the irrigation scheduling and practice. So it's impossible for me to say, use this plant and you're in the clear. Uh, you have to really tailor your plant species mix with what you've got. Um, in the way of soil and irrigation. Because if you're trying, for example, we did some work out here, we were trying to look at native plants and flowering plants, everything else. If you had heavier soils and you uh, used uh, sprinkler irrigation, you would end up with non-native grasses just overrunning everything. So 
it, it was uh, useless trying to maintain uh, a mixed culture with uh, lots of uh, flowering plants, for example, and getting our uh, shepherd's purse in the mix. Uh, uh, You'd have to look in Ontario. I don't believe you have the same level of uh, climbing cutward damage that we have out here. But again, looking at the, the spray uh, frequency uh, types of sprays, you'd have to tease that out to see if it's other sprays. Sprays applied for against other pests are controlling the cutworm or whether that would be something that would be useful out there. Okay, thank you. Um, I will, as I indicated in the chat, I will circulate a list of the participants and the presenters to the group so that if anybody has specific questions for you, they can talk to you, Tom. And we're gonna thank move you. on to the next new registrations and label expansions. And I have uh, Tom up next, Tom BASF. Clark, Tom Clark, share your screen, please. Unmute yourself, please. How's that? Looks That's good, go ahead. Very good, okay. Well. Welcome to everybody. Uh, hope you're having a nice Friday or Thursday. It is yes. So today I want to discuss some of the new uh, registrations, expansions, expansions for Seraphil, which, which was uh, first labeled in 2019 for grapes. Since we want to work. Um, how's that? I'm just having some technical difficulties here. Um, could, could you go to the next person, please? Yep. Um, okay, that would be, uh, Belgium. Yeah. Okay. Th thank you. Thank you, Wendy. Okay. Yeah, can you come on, please? Yeah, thanks, uh, Wendy. Um, I will share my screen. Uh, PowerPoint. Can you see this okay? Yes. And where is, oh, there. How are we doing here? What do you see in there, Wendy? Are you seeing the presentation mode? I can see your title, but I can't see the slides, but let's just go with it this way and progress through if we can't get the presentation mode. Try that. Oh, you know what? Now I can't see it on my side. <laughs> All right, there we go. This is good enough. You know, you might want to change your in your display settings to switch, switch presenter views. That's top left display settings. Thanks, Matt. Settings, swap presenter view and slideshow. Yep. Hey. I wondered how to do that. Thank you. Okay, so you can see it there? Yes, okay. go for it. Okay, here we go. Uh, so there's the uh, the quick uh, quick and dirty. I know I don't have a lot of time and we've got lots to cover. So I'm trying to try to stay to my 10 or 15 minutes of uh, time allocation. Uh, we've got a diplomat, which is a biofungicide, Baluca, a bioherbicide, biocult, which is the mycorrhizae trichoderma root inoculant, Kelpak, which we're bringing in uh, as a just as a demonstration for this year, which is a biostimulant, 
and Scorpio, a bioinsecticide. So we'll see what we can do here. It's just a quick overview and the changes that are happening in 2021. So uh, for Diplomat, you're probably aware it's the, uh, the only group 19 uh, fungicide that's out there. Um, its mode of action is a chitin biosynthesis inhibitor, a FRAC-19. Um, and it has effect on any of the uh, uh, true fungi that have chitin in their cell walls. So it really destroys that cell wall. And it, um, as you see on that image on the right-hand side there, it's healthy, hyphy on the bottom uh, picture. And on the top, you see those bulbous um, outcroppings of, um, of the cell wall of the, uh, of the pathogen. Uh, so it's got a very broad label, grapes are included, and what's exciting about uh, the label this year is that uh, we've added Fomopsis and Downy mildew to it. Uh, so in addition to the Botrytis and Powdery mildew already on the label. Uh, it has no effect on the bacteria, so it makes for a nice, uh, nice tank mix with some of the Bacillus products that have already been uh, discussed. It's got that zero day pre-harvest. Uh, it does have organic uh, in the U.S under the brand name Oso. Uh, and we do have plans of submitting that uh, for organic use in the future. Uh, there's maximum of three apps at the high rate, uh, which is a total then of active ingredient of 150 grams active ingredient. And I put a couple of those references down below just to talk about uh, chitin um, in the umycete fungi uh, group as well. And that's why downy mildew is on the label and it gets some pretty good control there. It does have control on the label. Uh, Baluca, the bioherbicide. This is also quite new for us. It is a, a non-selective herbicide, also a desiccant in some other crops. It's also, it's bio-based, derived from sunflowers. Uh, the current Formulation is a 500 gram per liter uh, EC formulation. Um, the active is pelargonic acid. It's all natural. It breaks down into carbon dioxide and water in the soil. Uh, it's basically a, a nine carbon molecule. And it just burns, uh, burns off uh, any of the, uh, any of the uh, weed species um, in both uh, broad, uh, broad leaf and grassy species. What's also interesting is that some of those real difficult uh, weeds like mosses, liverworts, echocetum are also uh, burned down very quickly. Um, sucker control is also on this label. Uh, that might be interesting also to the grape sector. Uh, there's no residue and a 24 hour pre-harvest. So just a quick uh, image of uh, before and after shots. Uh, the general dose rate is 16 liters per hectare. The formulation between the 680 grams per liter and the 500 grams per liter may make a, a slight difference in the short term, but our plan is to have that 680 grams per liter formulation in the Ontario or the Canadian marketplace. So uh, stay tuned on that. Uh, there's just an image of some sucker control. Uh, it's a lower dose rate. And of course, it'll be suckers in four to six leaf stage. They got to be less than 15 centimeters, uh, you know, not lignified uh, suckers, re relatively fresh. Um, and of course, the vine's gotta be at least two years old, maybe even a little more, so there's no damage on the young growth there. And best results for Beluga, warm temperatures, sunny day, it will just burn the, uh, um, the, the weeds down. Uh, the next one is a mycorrhizae product called BioCult. And um, I'm grateful to Justine for presenting that already. So I don't have to go over the, um, on how mycorrhizae works. Uh, but BioCult is a combination treatment applied to the roots of plants that consist of two types of beneficial fungi. So there's three different species of endomycorrhizae. And it also has a trichoderma asperellum in this mixture. So this product then stimulates plant growth, improves nutrient uptake, and the package is a 200 grams per hectare root drencher dip. This product will go uh, as, a, as a drench uh, through the sprayer, I suppose, or uh, through the irrigation system is also an option. Well, this will be our first year as we try uh, to uh, get some more data and try to prove some of the, 
results that we've seen across the uh, continent and also uh, in, in uh, different continents, actually. This product comes from South Africa. And so they've got some results there that we're trying to duplicate here. So just to expand a little bit on what Justine already talked about. Um, so the rhizosphere is that area right around the root system. And that's a very small, relatively small area for the plant to actually grab hold of some of those immobile nutrients, macro and it's like phosphorus and also some of the micronutrients that don't move real well. Um, and so what mycorrhizae does then is that it extends that, that root zone into the mycorrhizosphere, we call that. And that can be up to 10 times the, the volume of space that, that that plant root can then extract nutrients and moisture. So that's the, the basic uh, philosophy of that. Um, so those are the three different species of mycorrhizae that are in this mixture. So like I mentioned earlier, uh, the Glomus genus is being reclassified pretty much on a daily basis. So you got to try to keep up with this space. Um, so if it says something on the label that looks odd, you'd better do a quick little Google search to find out what the old name was. Um, so even in the process of registering BioCult here in Canada, it was Glomus mosaea, which is now on the uh, label, but it's now called Funniliformis mosaea. Uh, on the label, we have Rhizophagus irregularis, it was previously known as Glomus interradices. And in Claro de Glomus etonicatum, it was previously known as Glomus etonicatum. So it's a really, uh, yeah, uh, static kind of a space in the classification of mycorrhizae genus. So they all perform different things. Uh, they all have different personalities and characteristics. And in all of those um, uh, products that Justine showed, uh, there are multiple species. And that is definitely a value proposition that you'd have to look for in any of the, uh, the mycorrhizae products that are out there. It's a team effort. Um, these individual, you know, if, you, if you're looking at an individual mycorrhizae product, it will ebb and flow. It will start and it will stop and it will decline and it will start to start up again um, in a in a in a you know in a weak kind of a space. They will move from growth to rest to growth to rest, and um, therefore a team really works well. They're also multifunctional. They provide different uh, functions in the soil environment, and I'm not going to go through individuals there what they do, but. Um, they provide different uh, value propositions. Uh, these are biostimulants. And any, of the, any products that are in the biostimulants sector, they work much better, or they show a better ROI, I should say, say in yield limiting environments, right? Like dry, wet, compacted soils, high salts, nutrient imbalances, biotic and abiotic stresses, and uh, even virus stress, which is kind of what I, we are looking into this year. Uh, we worked with Wendy uh, last summer a bit and we provided or we did get some data there. So I'm really grateful to Wendy for that. And we want to duplicate that again this year and expand it to at least six different vineyards. And we'll see what, uh, what we can do about uh, generating some data there this year here in Ontario. And grapes are very well known to be mycorrhizal. Trichoderma in this space, in this package of BioCult then, uh, it enhances the mycorrhizae association and it helps in nutrient use efficiency. It stimulates root growth and mycorrhizal fungal spore germination. So it's there really as a secondary ingredient, but it wakes up really fast, it, much faster than mycorrhizae spores do. And it just uh, primes the pump and it primes the root system in accepting that relationship between mycorrhizae and the root system even a day or two later. So out of South Africa, there was some work done in last summer. Uh, not to say that these are the kind of results we're going to get here because we're finding out that the, the growing conditions and the soil conditions there are very different. Um, organic matter is a factor. Uh, their organic matter is about 1%. Uh, they're quite happy with that kind of level of organic matter. So they're seeing some crazy results, but what we'll be looking for also here in Ontario is uh, growth in length for new plantings. 
growth in stem diameter and root biomass. Uh, if we can achieve those things this year, just to, just to establish a baseline of what we can expect with biocult in Ontario soils or Canadian soils. So they did do work. Um, I was kind of happy to see this and uh, I had to dig this out of some older uh, work that was done, but they did show value proposition with virus expression um, or results in, um, in yield and, and, um, and quality parameters. So again, I, we don't have this, we don't have enough data yet to, uh, to verify this, but we're gonna be looking at that this year. And the reason for that, uh, they believe, is that it's chlorophyll content that is maintained in the, um, in the leaf um, canopy. Uh, so chlorophyll A and chlorophyll B are improved with a mycorrhizae biocult application. So we're hoping to look at that too. And I'm not sure if there's any equipment that we can borrow <laughs> or if we'll have to go and, and buy some of that equipment ourselves to monitor chlorophyll content. But that'll be, uh, that'll be really interesting. So uh, moving on to a biostimulant, uh, we've got a new product that's on the way and also being tested here in Ontario this summer, and it's called Kelpac. Uh, it's a different type of kelp product. It, is, it comes from the plant uh, Eclonia maxima, uh, also in the, uh, the Cape, cold, cold uh, waters off the, uh, the Cape uh, in South Africa. Uh, they use a different type of a, 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 an extraction method called a cell birth extraction. That's what makes this one somewhat uh, different. It shows more auxin-like response rather than cytokinin response that you'll see in the Ascophyla nodosum um, uh, products. Very good products. Uh, they're just a little bit, they're just different in how they're expressed. And so that's what we're interested in adding this product as a drench first with the biocult product and to see whether or not that's, uh, there's an effect there. So it'd be a single drench uh, with the microbials, like I said, or multiple foliar applications at critical points of influence during the crop cycle at around 0.3 to 1%. The value proposition there is improved root growth, uh, pollen and pollen tube growth, stress tolerance, cell division and cell expansion. So this is just a bigger bit of a graph kind of showing what the differences are in between the different kelp products. So Eclonia here in the green and the uh, Ascophyllum type of kelp products in the, in the red. Definitely see more above soil. Uh, so the, in the canopy, you'll see a better uh, response there. But in the root zone, there, there appears to be more activity with an Eclonia type of kelp. So as a total biomass, that's what you're kind of seeing there on the right-hand side, uh, more biomass as a result of that better root system. So the other really interesting space is the effect of CalPAC on the viability of beneficial soil micro microbes. And this really interested me because of the trichoderma boost with a 1% CalPAC application in the drench. So we're gonna be looking at that as a potential value proposition also with CalPAC. So the very last one I wanted to just mention, and I, I put this in last minute as uh, Tom was talking, um, because Scorpio is being trialed out in the West for cutworms. Uh, Scorpio is an insect and ant bait that's been around for a bit now, a couple of years, but it is a spinosad bait, uh, basically for insect and ant, uh, as an ant bait. Uh, it's also got suppression of spotted wing drosophila but the BC minor use is going to be submitting this as a, um, as a, a potential for control or a suppression of um, uh, the cutworms that they're having issue with in BC. And the image on the right hand side is just our rep there, Mike Boot, who uh, rigged up this little uh, this, uh, um, uh, Scorpio applicator and he would buzz through the uh, vineyard then dropping the pellets at the base of the vines. Very interesting. Uh, so that was last summer and uh, still evaluating that to see what happens. So that's basically it, Wendy. That's kind of the whole bio-rational lineup at Balsham. And uh, that's uh, Ron's contact information and my contact information. And um, that pretty much sums it up. Okay. Thanks, Yauk. Um We'll save questions for the end just so that we can try to get back on time. I know I was part of the problem. 
Uh, Tom, do you have your PowerPoint working or should we move to Nick? Clark? Okay, try again. Go off mute, please. Tom, we can't hear you. Okay, how's that? Okay, gotcha, go. Okay, great, sorry about that. Okay, yes, uh, Seraphil has been labeled since 2019 for grapes. We're seeing some pretty good results and we've uh, just increased the registrations for about 10 more other crops. Oh, it's, free it's freezing up again, I'm sorry. <laughs> it's funny, I'm not sure what's going on. Okay. Um, Do you want me to bring Nick back? And if you don't go on PowerPoint presentation, maybe it'll work. Uh, yes. Uh, I'm having difficulties here. Uh, yeah, get back to me, please. Thank you. Okay, Nick, you're up. Hello, Surprise. can you hear me? Hi. Yeah, I can't see you though. Do you have a oh, presentation? I do, if you'll give me one moment. Okay. All right, can you see my screen? No, Tom has to stop sharing his first. Okay, okay try now, Nick. Okay. Can you see my screen? Yep. Okay, um, so I know it was a little bit of a late addition. How much time do I have, Wendy? Five minutes, talk fast. Five minutes, mercy. Okay, uh, I am Nick. I am the technical advisor for Pure Spray Green Spray Oil 13E, the horticultural and mineral oil. Um, with five minutes there, I don't really have too much to get into in depth, but um, let's see what we can accomplish. So- can you just tell us what's new as yeah. opposed to the spiel? Let's go. So what's new? Um, We've been focusing on a lot of new trials in different areas to address either regulatory changes or some new needs. We've, I've been lucky because Tom Lowry presented before me um, and he really hammered in the most important thing with using oils in an unconventional way, which is timing, 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 timing. And we know that if we can apply products with the right timing, we can get into some new pests and some new applications. So based on some work that Tom did, we saw some good results with uh, leaf hoppers out West, where with 1%, he was able to see about 30% reduction, 2%, about 60% reduction. Um, we're also continuing to do some work out on cherries out West, where we're trying to incorporate pure spray green in a, a powdery mildew program in replace of Quintec. We had a first run at this trial last year, and it was a terrible year to conduct a trial because of frost and other issues. So we're going to repeat the trial this year. We're also looking at some work with beneficials in greenhouses. Obviously, Pure Spray Green and other oils target small insects, which is a concern for greenhouse growers and those using beneficial insects. So we wanted to figure out what is the actual risk. Uh, our first round of testing, we tested in the lab setting using parasitic wasps, uh, specifically in Carcia and Eretomoceris. And in this case, we saw actually good effects. Uh, Pure Spray Green did not have a drastic impact when it was sprayed against the eggs. There was a significant impact with the dip, however. So we're going to continue working in the greenhouse space, looking at how oils can be safely integrated with beneficials. Most importantly, timing again, if you're going to spray to knock down, wait until the oil dries before you introduce your beneficials. And a quick rundown of some Hi, other late... Oh. And uh, a quick rundown of some label expansions we're working on. So leafhoppers on grapes have been submitted. Coddling moth on apples and pears have also been submitted. And we have uh, a few other applications. Greenhouse ornamentals, deter feeding by aphids on leafy vegetables, uh, dormant application for scale on berries and small fruit. And we're looking at uh, expanding into herbs and spices as well. And that'll be for mites, powdery mildew, and aphids. 
Um, and then we have our cannabis specific spray oil as well, Pure Spray FX, which is out there. If you guys have any questions, come to me. I think that's under five minutes. Do I get a prize? You do. My my unlasting, everlasting gratitude. <laughs> no problem. I think, I think the leaf hopper issue is very interesting for the organic growers because we are pretty stuck. It would be interesting to see what the effect is on potato leaf hopper, though. Very curious as well. If we get the right timing and if we get the right coverage, I think we'll see some good effects. But uh, as Tom mentioned, it's really about doing proper scouting. Um, and then again, just getting that good coverage. Okay, so this is where the growers on the call, if you're interested in looking at this, let me know and I'll get in touch with Nick and we will try to figure something out. Cool. Tom, you ready? Yes, I am ready. I think my, I don't know, something's wrong. Around. I'll just tell you what's changed. Okay. So Seraphil has expanded the label for vegetables and some small fruits. Are you sharing uh, your screen or are you just going to talk? I'll just talk. I'll okay. just talk. It, it's, it's stuck. Cool. So anyways, it's, it's acquired a label for, for carrots, for, for leaf blight, uh, partial suppression, powdery mildew. For potatoes, it has a label for uh, suppressing early blight. And it has an infra label for soilborne rhizoctomia, stem canker, and blackstur, black scurf. And for sugar beets, it's a uh, sarcospora leaf spot. And it also have a, has a label for peppers, for botrytis gray mold and powdery mildew suppression. For tomatoes, it has a label for early blight and botrytis gray mold. For lettuce, it's botrytis gray mold and white mold and downy mildew. For cucurbits and squash, downy mildew and powdery mildew. And for small fruit, for cane berries, it's botrytis gray mold suppression. Bush berries, such as blueberries um, or in currants, botrytis gray mold for grapes. Of course, it's botrytis gray mold and powdery mildew and low growing berries, low, low bush blueberry and strawberry. So just a few quick management considerations. The rate is for 0 0.25 to 0 0.5 kilograms per hectare for Seraphil. Ensure thorough coverage. Water pH needs to be between four and nine and use of surfactant can improve performance. Rain fast is under three hours, just a little under three hours. Re-entry intervals are four hours. Pre-harvest interval is, is zero days and their MRLS, MRL status is exempt. So thank you very much. If you have any more questions, please contact me, 905-441-1608. Thank you. Okay, uh, Ryan, you're up. Okay, sure. on it. Let me just share my screen. Zach, can you see that? Yes. Okay, great. Okay, well, uh, welcome everybody. Thanks for uh, thanks for joining us today. Um, we've got a lot of good presentations so far. Uh, really, this is kind of a, a nice precursor to what I'm going to be talking about here too. So uh, it was nice to hear some of those comments because uh, it gives me a little more reinforcement uh, that uh, these program these products work well in a program. Um, and um, I'm so used to working with conventional growers. So so this was a, a nice little. Um, kind of outside the box thinking for me. Um, this gives me a great opportunity to investigate the new products, uh, the options available and to understand how they work and how they would fit into a season long program. Um, so for many years now, I've had this dream of developing a season long fungicide program without the use of coppers. Um, so that was my primary goal in developing this program. Not sure if we can totally get there, um, but uh, this is a work in progress. So uh, I will throw that as a caveat um, to the program. Um, and uh, these introduction of the new bios, I, I think have, have almost made this possible uh, to be able to, to get there without coppers. Um, seasonal differences may come into play, but uh, um, we will uh, we'll see how this pans out. So typically in, a, in an organic talk, uh, here's, my, here's my disclaimer. Um, you know, what I'm gonna talk about today, uh, all the products listed and discussed are potentially organic. However, as we know, 
everybody is under a different certification body and always check with your certification body to determine if the product you want to use is acceptable for use. A um, couple other things just before we really get going. I'm not going to be discussing anything in the BM1 fungicide group. Um, I really was trying to focus on organic products. That grouping is kind of a little bit in, in limbo right now with organics. They're not recognized as organic. Um, that includes Fracture and ProGlad Plus. So I just want to let you know that the, those are not in here, uh, but they can have some, some fits into soft programs. Um, also not including Diplomat. I know Belkheim just uh, um, presented on Diplomat, uh, but again, not currently recognized as organic. So I'm just going to keep that out for now. All right, so I know a lot of you know this already, uh, but just as a reinforcement point, and uh, it was great to hear Tom Lowry also kind of reinforce some of these points. So we know we're dealing with an organic situation. When we're dealing with an organic situation, choosing materials is only a small piece to an effective pest management program. First of all, you know, what I've got here is I got about eight points that should be considered when you're developing any pest control program, regardless of the crop you're looking at. Um, first of all, annual sprayer calibration. It's very important. Um, first of all, we want to know that those nozzles have overwintered properly. Um, if you didn't check your nozzles at the end of last season, always good to, to open up the season this year with uh, a quick calibration. Um, you want to be sure that the output that the nozzles are, are giving you equals the expected output the, of the manufacturer from the nozzles. Um, good way to do this, if you have any flow monitors in your sprayers, then uh, this is a really easy tool uh, to be able to diagnose some of these issues. If you think you're going to run out of a spray at a certain acreage um, and all of a sudden you don't and you're, you have some left in the tank or alternately you run out too early, we know we're dealing with either a clog nozzle or a nozzle that's putting out too much. So, so that's one good way of diagnosing. Um, spraying speed, obviously, we, we need to be aware of. Uh, one of the biggest factors in achieving good coverage is your speed of spraying. Um, I hope everybody's going less than 10K. I really hope that <laughs> anybody going over 12K and are having problems, they, that would be the first thing I would look at is your application speed. Um, proper water volumes as well. We just got to really match um, what we're trying to cover with the appropriate water volumes. I was always taught, and I'm sure you've heard the, the analogy of trying to paint a wall. If the wall's small early in the season with smaller shoots, then we obviously don't need as much paint, which means we don't need as much water. Secondly, we want to know what diseases are present at each growth stage throughout the season. Obviously, um, all major pests need to be covered in that tank mix. Cultivar susceptibility to disease infections in past history. Um, be aware of the susceptibility of each variety. Uh, we know that in, in vineyards, uh, especially around here, um, Chardonnay and Riesling seem to be the kind of the can canaries in the coal mine uh, with, with mildews, powdery mildew especially. So anytime a grower contacts me and says, well, I don't think I'm gonna be able to cover my entire field before this rain, at least go out and cover those sensitive varieties. Uh, be sure that they're covered first. I also have a lot of growers that will just go to those varieties first regardless and make sure they're covered and then go to the less susceptible varieties after that. Product efficacy, pretty self-explanatory. Um, efficacy tables in 360 that Wendy puts together are, are an awesome resource. And I also have, uh, have that uh, listed here in a couple slides. Uh, be aware of any potential incompatibilities. Quick ones just to be aware of, uh, and I think they've also been touched on already. Uh, oils and sulfur do not mix. Oils and lots of copper applications don't mix. Uh, so those are, are two really important ones with oils. And uh, again, I'm going to be talking uh, a little bit about oils here going forward. So we just want to keep those in mind. Reapplication intervals. Um, you know, we just got to be sure that uh, we're, we're recovering uh, the new growth that's coming on, as well as recovering any residues that got washed off with weather. I always tell growers to be in the mindset of about a seven day reapplication window. Um, if you have that mindset and you go in every seven days, pretty good chance you're not gonna have any problems, um, especially if you're choosing the right materials. It's when we start stretching beyond that is where we get into problems. So instead of having that, that 10 day mindset to reapply, shift that down to seven. And if you get delayed past the seven, it's not the end of the world, but at least uh, we know that, that we wanna stay close to that seven days. Reapplication intervals, obviously, 
um, be aware of what tasks need to be done and then choosing your product accordingly so you can do those tasks. And since many organic products only provide to suppression, uh, these canopy management tasks are very important. Um, those things like weed control to, to increase your, your airflow, um, rachis removal during pruning to, to decrease the potential for any black rot if it's there, uh, shoot thinning before bloom to, to give adequate spacing, shoot positioning before bloom and especially after bloom to be able to give each shoot their space. Um, hedging is also important to, to maintain airflow and uh, also basal leaf removal to, to again, airflow around those, those bunches and to increase spray penetration around those bunches too. Okay, let's get into the meat of it. Um, so what do we have available to us? Uh, so looking at our early season diseases, well, Thomopsis is definitely early season disease. Black rot lingers a little bit more later too. Um, but when we look at what's available to us in an organic sense, there's not a lot for these two diseases. Um, Phomopsis, really, we have oxidate uh, as a suppression effect. It's labeled. Um, we also know from Greg's presentation there that uh, Lifeguard has good activity on Phomopsis, but uh, it's currently not listed on the label. Okay, so if you're focusing on downy mildew and Phomopsis is around, you're going to get great control. Um, black rot. Now, there's something else that, that we traditionally use copper materials to give us some suppression effect. Stargus shows some suppression, oxidate is showing some suppression as well, a partial suppression. Um, and again, looking at that efficacy data from Lifeguard, um, that's another one that's looking like we could have some effect on black rot. So uh, when we get to my, my, my program here, um, you'll, you'll see that Lifeguard is a major important part of this. And, and that was really what I was focusing on to, to be kind of that, almost that copper replacement. Um, but we always have in our back pocket that we can add some copper in with that. Um, knowing that, that they are compatible in a tank mix. Okay, powdery mildew. We have a little more options available to us. Um, the color coding is basically just if it's registered for full control or registered for suppression. Our old standbys are there, sulfur materials, um, you know, old reliable, four formulations available. Again, check with your certifying body what is uh, acceptable to use. Some of these are OMRI US certified and not OMRI Canada. Um, I know Cumulus is EcoCert certified. So uh, if I had a choice to choose a sulfur, I would choose either Coast of It or Cumulus, and mainly just because they're the, the two, two sulfur formulations that seem to be the easiest to mix. Um, the other two requires some, some mixing in a pail beforehand to be able to get everything uh, into suspension. Um, oils. Um, yeah, I'm going to talk a bit more about oils here in a second. Um, but uh, oils, because we have some effect with some of these early season diseases, um, especially powdery mildew, um, I can see the, the oils kind of being, again, a replacement in there for some of our, our sulfur sprays earlier on. We do have to be aware that sulfur and oils don't mix. So um, if we're choosing to use oils in, into a program and we want to come back to sulfur later on, we just need to be sure that we have a duration of time in between and you're not tank mixing or putting one right on top of the other. Um, a little more expensive than sulfurs. However, uh, we may get some, some slight suppression on insects, which is a, you know, a little bit we've talked about already today. Um, great alternative for sulfur sensitive varieties uh, to use oils um, in your program. Um, that especially goes for the hybrids, uh, especially the French hybrids that are a little more sensitive to sulfur under warmer conditions. Um, going down the list, Timorex Gold, uh, it's got a full control on its label. Uh, again, kind of oil is, is the main driving force there on the Timorex. Um, it is a tea tree oil and not a mineral oil. Um, so it's a little different, different source. Um, the biggest downfall I see with Timorex right now is price point. Um, it's, uh, I worked it out at the two liter rate, you're looking at about $180 a hectare. So it's uh, quite a bit more than the oils, um, where oils at a full rate, you're looking at you know, $75 to $90 and the Timorex is $180. So you're, you're looking at at least double. Um, so so that, that's a little problematic. Buran is in there, garlic powder, again, suppression effect. Um, We've heard a little bit about that this morning too. Regalia Max, uh, Seraphil, Double Nickel, um, Serenade Opti. Uh, again, some of these materials will give us some botrytis action as well. Uh, we know Lifeguard's gonna give us that action on, on powdery that we want. Um, and uh, same with Actinobate. 
Okay, so, so that's kind of our list that we can go through uh, for powdery mildew. And now let's kind of bring back oil into the topic here. Um, for a few years now, I've been working with growers and uh, looking at pre-bloom applications uh, of, of replacing sulfur with oils. Um, so what I decided to do here today is just kind of present some, some advantages and disadvantages of, of, of both products. And uh, then, you know, that, that allows you to make your own decisions. Um, sulfur materials have historically been relied on heavily in organic programs all the way through the season. Uh, one thing that we will see on sulfur labels is there is a maximum number of applications. Um, right now it is listed at eight applications. So you should not be using more than eight sulfur applications a season. When you're looking at um, developing a program in organics, you're looking at a program with 12, 12 plus sprays. So, you know, wanting to mix sulfur in with each of those with a max of eight, you can't. So um, replacing some of those sulfur sprays with oils allows us to, to continue to use sulfur later in the season. So some of the advantages here of sulfur, as we know, multi-site activity, no resistance issues. Um, strong activity against powdery mildew. Uh, again, this is a protective mechanism, so coverage is really important, um, but uh, if everything's adequate, then uh, we do get strong activity. It is compatible with other materials and biologicals. It's got activity against that early season uranium mite, the sulfur does, which is, uh, again, the beneficial thing because we've used that really as our main control for that early season uh, uranium mite. It can also provide kickback and post-infection activity against powdery mildew. Um, typically, when we use it in that sense, that is a little later in the season, um, and, uh, and we're mixing it in with some of the bicarb products at that point if we need to. Disadvantages, like I say, maximum of eight apps a season can be harmful to beneficial mite populations. Uh, we have seen with, with routine sulfur applications, especially in a hot and dry season, we run into problems with European red mite and two-spotted spider mite later in the season. Uh, and what happens there is that sulfur can have an impact on the beneficial mite population early, which throws off that balance and the, uh, the bad mites, the European red mites and two spots kind of prevail and then take over. Uh, talked about the disadvantage around sensitive cultivars like hybrids. Um, we're not compatible with oils, with sulfur. So we need to make that decision, oil or sulfur. And then we, if we want to transition back, we need a, a duration in between. Um, also, late season applications, there is some residue concerns with sulfur. 21 day PHI, as long as we're following that, we're in good shape. All right. Um, so some local experience I've had with a number of my grower clients where we have used oil in our pre-bloom program instead of sulfur. Advantages of that. Uh, Multi-site activity, again, no risk of, of resistance developing just like sulfur. Good activity against powdery mildew, which is our primary pest that we're targeting with oils. Compatible with biological products, um, plant extracts and peroxides. So really tank mixing is, is, is pretty good with, with most of these materials. Um, on the label, it says can be tank mixed with the copper for a single application pre-bloom. Um, and you'll see in my program here coming up that uh, that I, I do take advantage of that for one spray. Um, but really, that's about the only copper application I, I put into the program. And I decided to use Cueva mainly because of the low percentage of copper in that product. Comparable activity to sulfur against early season uranium mite. That was one question we had when we were looking at these transitions. Uh, will the oils hold up against uranium mite? And it seems like they are um, enough anyway to, to keep uranium mite uh, below a threshold level. Possibly some suppression against mealybugs and scale if exposed. Um, again, not fully investigated yet. Uh, it's not our primary focus with the, these oils early in the season, um, but it could be one of these, these benefits or a side effect. Um, that, that we can take advantage of, especially in that, that very first spray where we may be able to, to, to cover some of those exposed crawlers. Uh, also, we know that there's very low risk of phytotoxicity and no residue concerns. Um, disadvantages, as we said, not compatible with sulfur, requires a duration between application of oil and sulfur, uh, typically 10 to 14 days is that safe zone. Um, and it can result in foliar burning and premature leaf drop if tank mixed with a lot of copper-based fungicides. Um, we've, we've, we've seen that locally, unfortunately, um, and uh, it's something that, that we definitely want to avoid in the full program. All right, again, quickly just going through downy mildew options that we have here, our old standbys, 
coppers. Uh, it was our backbone of our downy mildew program for many, many, many years. And uh, now I am looking at, at trying to replacing those coppers with sprays like Lifeguard and Stargus um, to, to be able to reduce the um, reliance on coppers. Um, the other thing we know that coppers are heavy metal. They can bioaccumulate in the soil. They have a negative impact on soil microbes. And I know some of these organic operations are also using livestock to do some weed control and basal leaf removal. Um, again, there's some concerns there about heavy metal ingestion in some of the, the, uh, the sheep and things like that being used in some of these vineyard settings. So um, again, coppers, it's had a place for many years, um, but like I say, it's been one of my, one of my pet peeves uh, with copper and uh, hopefully we can reduce the reliance of copper with these, with these new materials. All right, so I mentioned here the efficacy tables. I've basically taken this directly out of 360. Um, uh, again, we, we want to thank Wendy for putting these, these tables together. I know it takes a lot of effort to do so, a lot of investigating, uh, a lot of going to other uh, provinces or, or other states to see what their efficacy ratings are with these products and then uh, putting it all together in one spot. So it takes a lot of work, um, but it's a very valuable resource. So uh, we appreciate that. Um, just kind of working down each row here. So uh, it kind of gives us just a, an idea of what we have for options for each of these. Phomopsis, we know that we want to focus on Phomopsis from bud break to bloom. Um, sulfur materials give us some suppression, copper suppression, um, but it looks like, you know, Lifeguard with an efficacy, efficacy rating of three, um, which is a higher rating, uh, it looks like uh, it, it's going to do some work for us. Um, same thing with black rot. Black rot's always been a problem in organic programs. We've really been strictly relying on copper to give us some suppression, but now with a lot greater efficacy with lifeguard, that could be something else that we're going to see nice effects with. Downy mildew. Again, another one of these crutches in uh, an organic program. Uh, we never had a lot in our toolbox to be able to use against downy mildew. Um, again, copper materials were that, that standby, that backbone. Um, some work better than others against downy mildew. We have a range of kind of a, a suppression to, to a control range uh, with some of the coppers. But again, Lifeguard is, seems to be standing out right in, in downy mildew control. So, so that's a bonus. Powdery, we have more options. Uh, we have uh, good options in our standbys like sulfurs. Um, we've got obviously oils. Um, we've got actinovate. We've got some really suppressant materials like regalia, buran that could be work into kind of a tank mix to kind of give us some suppression, but it wouldn't be good as a standalone with these suppressant materials. Seraphil looks like it has some decent action against powdery and botrytis. Um, and again, coppers were obviously going to give us some powdery action too. Um, Lifeguard, we know, has some powdery activity, but it's not quite as strong as the others. Botrytis. A lot of these botrytis products also have powdery mildew effectiveness. So um, just kind of looking at the twos here, Timorex Gold, Seraphil, and Serenade are kind of the ones that are really stand out against botrytis. And we've got some of these other suppressant materials in here and available that we can use too. Okay, so just talking a little bit more about botrytis and powdery mildew, we want to consider these materials when we're approaching a growth stage where botrytis pressure starts to increase. There's, there's kind of three growth stages that I really focus this on. One is that that immediate post bloom timing. Um, that's when we have a lot of debris and, and uh, bloom flower debris that, that's dying back. And uh, as we know with botrytis, if we have the right conditions with dead and degrading tissues present, we can easily have botrytis infections. So, so that is one time, especially if it is uh, a wet post bloom period. Um, and maybe even extended, then we have a little bit more botrytis pressure at that time. So that'd be a good, good timing to get something in there for botrytis. The next timing I always focus on botrytis is that cluster closure timing, um, getting a, a material inside that bunch before you can't anymore, before those berries swell up enough that, that you literally can't access the inside of the cluster. So right up berry touch would be, is a great time to kind of again, focus another material inside that bunch before it closes out to have material inside to work against botrytis. Um, recognize that not all varieties are at risk for botrytis. These botrytis sprays, again, are pricey and expensive um, and not necessary on all varieties. So really focusing on thin-skinned, tight-clustered varieties, such as the Pinot varieties, they are classic for, for botrytis. 
um, Pinot Noir, Pinot Gris. They're tight bunched, thin skinned, and those berries, as they swell, they literally push against each other so hard that you can pop berries right out of the bunch, and then they become dead and degrading tissue and a source for botrytis to come in. Riesling is another tight bunch with a thin skin, so it's uh, again at risk. Sauvignon Blanc can get very tight. Um, Chardonnay, uh, depending on the clone, you can have botrytis pressures there too. Uh, but when you start looking at some of the Bordeaux reds and some of the hybrids with really thick skinned and looser bunch, you don't need to focus on botrytis nearly as bad as much in there. Um, they're just naturally resistant based on their morphology. So, uh, and again, with these sprays, I'd be looking at from the price of them to be able to focus those sprays just really where I need it uh, and uh, it becomes a little more cost effective in your strategy. Uh, so I've talked about the materials already uh, in the efficacy chart, so I won't go through those again. All right, so we're almost there. We're almost into the meat of it. I know the anticipation is killing everyone. Um, so basically what, uh, what, what my goal here today was to do was to develop an organically acceptable spray program that limits the use of traditional copper products and integrates in some of the new and pre-existing biologicals. Now, take this as a working document, okay? This is not a, a, a proven spray program by any means. Um, this is just really coming off the top of my head of putting together programs. So, um, so approach it with a, a little bit of caution as this has not yet been tested under large scale conditions. Um, really what I've been taking to put this program together is looking at the true efficacy data of the products and making sure that I'm covering all my major diseases and pests in the program at each growth stage. So, uh, so that's kind of how I want to approach this. So without further ado, let's get into it. Okay, so like I mentioned before, we have uh, eight applications of sulfur we can use to be able to, to allow us to use those sulfur applications when I feel they're most important, and that's post-bloom. Um, I feel like, like we can use oil sprays pre-bloom. And like I say, we've had some experience in this in a conventional sense, and a lot of growers I've worked with is very happy with this program. And uh, it has proven to be effective against uranium mite as well as early season powdery mildew. So let's start with the first spray. Right at the beginning, two to three leaves, don't need to spray um, generally before that for any major diseases. Um, but you can, if, if you wanna look at kind of dormant sprays more for the insect side of things, I know there's been some investigation into that, um, but I'm gonna start right here at our traditional first spray timing. And uh, again, looking at oils at a one and a half percent solution, targeting real early powdery mildew. This may be too early to get some powdery mildew, but um, I'm using this mostly to, to be sure that we're starting our program against uranium mite. And this early, early spray may also give us some effect on those mealybug and scale crawlers if exposed and if, if present, and if we can actually cover them completely. So uh, I know there's a lot of ifs there, um, but um, again, any effect uh, on those insects we'll, we'll take. Um, decided to, to use oxidate in this, this scenario early in the season, mainly because it is rated as one of the ones that, that is decent against phomopsis, um, and it is a registered against phomopsis too. I also kind of like oxidate early in the season, again, as a general sterile. Um, who knows what else we can get with it? Uh, so uh, getting it in a program early um, in this kind of one place, uh, I, I can see a fit. Next spray, again, relying on oil to maintain our powdery mildew and uranium mite control. Um, in here, I've been looking at kind of that one copper to, to mix in. Um, we have a choice. We can either go another oxidate spray to focus on Fomopsis, but integrating in a quave at this point will give us additional black rock control um, and will probably give us a little better from Opsis control too. So um, uh, that's kind of where I'm looking at, at that. Um, the rate for quave or oxidate are both 1% at this stage. Okay. Um, again, looking now we're into kind of this uh, growth stage at 20 centimeters when downy mildew really starts coming into play. Um, this is where I, I can see kind of the start of lifeguard uh, working into programs. Um, I know according to Greg uh, that they don't like to go too much earlier than this with lifeguard. They wanna have enough tissue present to, to, uh, to, to be able to, to get the product um, on, on and into the system. So, uh, so I, his recommendation was to, was to go beyond five leaves. So I see that this is a good fit here in that 20 centimeter growth to, to start to bring in these SAR materials like lifeguard. Um, focusing on downy, 
we know that it's not registered or it's not labeled for black rotten tomopsis, but we're going to have pectimus on them. So again, taking advantage of that pre-bloom. Um, next spray, immediate pre-bloom. Um, again, looking at a back-to-back -back lifeguard in there and really just trying to build that, that resistance up um, before we get to kind of our major pressure season uh, bloom and beyond. So uh, kind of looking at kind of a repeat application in there. Um, this is also the time where if we need to do anything with leaf hoppers pre-bloom, this is the time to do it. Um, this is really site by site. And uh, if you choose to use Pyganic at this stage, uh, be sure that you can justify it. And why I say that is mainly because of the cost of the spray. At the four and a half liter rate, you're looking at about $300 a hectare to spray this. So again, making sure that, that it is needed. And I'm hoping with these oils early in the season, it is gonna keep leaf hopper populations at bay um, so that uh, maybe this isn't uh, a necessary spray. Um, so again, I'm leaving these insecticide sprays kind of if required. Um, this program mainly I'm focusing on disease management right now, um, but I, I just decided to throw in a couple insecticide timings um, just uh, so that we're, uh, you're aware uh, of where those timings are and if you need to do something about it. The next spray here uh, is where I was looking at um, kind of breaking lifeguard just a little bit, um, just because, uh, and again, Greg stated it earlier on that uh, it is, can be a standalone product, but when we have other things available to us, why make it standalone? Um, uh, it allows us to rotate a little bit too and uh, save applications. So, so here I, I looked at kind of a, a combination of Cerebral and Stargus, and this kind of brings up my first major question, and this is why I'm saying that this is kind of a working document, and uh, because this is titled a workshop, I would uh, also like to, to get people's feedback on this, chemical companies or whatnot, um, uh, between mixing two bacillus products together. I know we talked about this on a previous workshop um, that was probably okay, but they weren't, nobody was really 100% sure. So I, uh, that was one here that, that I really just wanted to kind of more raise as a question to see where we are in that and if, if this is kind of a viable uh, mixture at that stage. Ryan, Tim is on, still on if you want to, if he wants to comment on that now. That would yeah. be awesome. If it's yeah, I think that's a great thing to do. Yeah, thanks, Wendy. Hey, hey Ryan, Tim Johnson from Rowan here. Yeah, uh, yeah. technically, there's there's no reason you shouldn't be able to tank mix uh, the two bacillus products, uh, you know, both physically and biologically. I mean, they, even though they're both, uh, uh, say, bacillus amyloliquefations in the label, they do produce different peptides and so forth in fermentation. Uh, there's, you know, there's absolutely no reason that they shouldn't be compatible. Okay, good, good, great to know. Um, because actually I've got that coming up a little later here too in the cluster closure phase. So I, I just thought it was, a, it was a nice combination. Actually, nope, not quite at the cluster closure back here at Verizon, but we'll get to that shortly. Um, so, so moving in through Bloom, this is where, um, actually, let me just go back real quick. You've also noticed in this Bloom spray that I, I did not include any oils or sulfurs. This is kind of my break uh, in between the oil applications and then coming back in with sulfurs uh, after Bloom. Um, what I'd like to do with, with this one is keep this application interval tight. Um, we know we're dealing with, with two bacillus products here that uh, as far as efficacy goes, um, they're going to give us some action, but it's, it's, it may not be as, as strong as, as some of the others. So uh, again, this is a critical stage in bloom. I definitely wanted to, to break the oil and sulfur uh, mixture up. So, so this is what I, I found to be able to put into the bloom time phases. So what you'll see now as we move past bloom is when sulfur comes back into the picture. Um, I, I, I like sulfur, you know, I have no problem with sulfur at all. I think there's lots of benefits there. And especially when we're dealing with, with disease control post bloom, the kickback action um, and some of this uh, um, almost eradication effects that you can get with sulfur, uh, we'll, we'll take that, that uh, at any time uh, if we run into powdery. So post bloom, bring back lifeguard as well as the sulfur. And, and here's where we, we start looking at botrytis. Um, we, nice thing here is that lifeguard, uh, we may have some botrytis action too. So uh, that, that is something that we could take advantage of at that stage. Um, but I've also decided to put in kind of a standalone botrytis product as in Serenade 
Um, I know, again, it's a very expensive product to put in here, and I wouldn't recommend it on all blocks, but this would be something, especially if we have the right weather conditions, uh, if, if it's really hot and, and rainy uh, in that post-bloom phase when, when floral debris is dying back, it is important to have something for botrytis in those prone varieties. Um, I did a quick costing on Serenade, and you are looking at about $250 a hectare to, to apply that at the full rate. So again, expensive spray, wouldn't be recommended everywhere, only in your, your prone areas, um, and really if pressures uh, are extremely high. Um, pea size berries, maintaining sulfur. Again, you'll see lifeguard here kind of is three in a row. And what I'm doing there is just looking at efficacy against downy mildew and black rot. Um, you know, nothing really compares to the efficacy ratings that we're seeing right now in lifeguard. So during these real pressure times, I like to use the best products available. And right now I feel like that's, uh, that's sulfurs for powdery in an organic sense in lifeguard. So um, the other bonus with lifeguard is that you're going to also enhance your powdery mildew control. So, you know, it's, it's, you're using sulfur and lifeguard. So it's, everything's complementing each other, uh, which is the really nice way to look at it. Also in pea-sized berries is when berry moth starts to come into play. If you're not using bathing disruption, then this would be your time for a BT product like BioProtect, Dipel, or Zentari. Um, I would highly encourage using mating disruption if you can. Uh, you need a minimum size of, of 10 acres to be able to make that work. Um, but um, the BT products work pretty good as long as your timing is good and you're, you're getting good coverage on it. So, um, I'll talk a little bit more about berry moth here in a little bit. Through berry touch, again, kept lifeguard, again, looking at another botrytis material in there, the regalia. Um, it doesn't have to be regalia, like I say. It's, uh, I was just using that. It's a little more cost effective than serenade, um, but uh, we've also got um, some action on powdery mildew, which complements the sulfur. If you're getting into cluster closure, um, again, looking at berry moth, this is when our third generation typically comes on. Um, nice thing about maiden disruption is that you only put it out once and you're fully covered for the season. Uh, if you decide not to go that route, then you have to time applications a little more precise. Uh, getting into Berazon, this is kind of one of our last um, real pressure periods uh, for mildews especially. So kind of looking at, again, using good products in there. Um, and I'll also throw into this because we can mix in coffers with some of these, if we feeling like we are getting into more pressure zones um, and we want to complement this lifeguard with maybe another product, we can integrate in some coffers. But like I say, my, my intent was to try to put some together with minimal coffers, but always knowing that they're, they're in your back pocket. You can still use them and they are compatible. So uh, it, is, it is something that we just still need to consider if we need it. And for Azon, we've got our bacillus kind of um, combo here again, um, kind of as our last big kick at these uh, mildew and botrytis with Seraphil. Um, and then kind of after Verazon is when we can really bring back the, the spray. Uh, we should be gaining some, some natural resistance to mildews at that point, especially on the fruit. So, uh, so we shouldn't need as much control. And again, we, we'd like to um, kind of keep materials off those, those grapes as we're running up to harvest if possible. Um, we know that there's always some times, especially in an organic sense, where we may need to intervene after Brazon with something. May that be downy mildew again popping up in the upper canopy uh, or botrytis. Um, and we need to integrate in some more botrytis products, or even at that point, we can start looking at that mill stop approach uh, for botrytis. Um, but, uh, but generally, kind of our, our last mildew kicks are generally around Brazon. Pre harvest, if you need anything in an organic sense for sour rot then uh, the general recommendation that I would come up with would be using oxidate kind of as that, that sterilizing approach to kill those, those organisms identified in the sour rock complex, and then using another material to control the fruit flies. Um, and trust is the labeled material to be able to control fruit flies. Again, you're looking at an extremely expensive spray um, for that. Uh, Pyganic will probably give us some knockdown of those fruit flies as well. We're a little cheaper, but uh, fruit fly management is very, very important when you're, you're dealing with sour rot management. So I would highly encourage to have some sort of control for, for uh, fruit flies uh, into a sour rot management program if you're fighting with it. 
Okay, so so that's the program in general. Um, it's probably sparked a lot of conversation. I hope it has. Uh, so so let's. Uh, I'll be happy to take questions later on. Um, just got two or three more slides to go through before we can talk about this. Um, if needed, we do have a powdery mildew eradication strategy. Um, this is what conventional growers use as well, but uh, it is an organic uh, acceptable combination. Using a millstop or Sirocco as a bicarbonate product, mixing in with sulfur, um, and I've included rates down below, and rates are really based on water volumes for the bicarbonate products, and then um, with sulfur, using five to six kilograms as lots to be able to, uh, to help out with the, uh, um, the, uh, the mildew. The sulfur component also provides you with some forward protection, which is also nice. All right, quickly into, uh, into insects, just uh, very quickly. Uh, I just wanted to highlight a couple things here. Uh, when using pyganic, uh, it is a naturally derived pyrethrin. Um, a couple things that, that I've noticed experience-wise with pyganic, the pH of the water definitely does seem to be important. Um, there is a range of the pH from five and a half to seven, but it, I feel that the closer we can get to that five and a half range, the better efficacy we, we seem to get out of pyganic. Um, also, the rate is very dependent. There's a range. Please use the higher rate of pyganic. I know it adds cost, but uh, you really do need it for, for best results. Uh, also, don't wait too long with pyganic. It doesn't work well under higher pressure scenarios. It works a lot better when the leafhopper populations are beginning to build rather than when they're at their peak. We know kaolin clay also is available to us. It is a deterrence product. I know Pat mentioned he doesn't like working with it, and I, I get it. Uh, it is something that's messy to work with. It is something that requires routine applications, um, and it's a heavy powder. Uh, so, you know, mixing it in is always difficult, especially at the label rates. What I've seen is the biggest uh, bonus there with, with kaolin clay uh, is that you don't need to do that, that full, full rate at the beginning. You can bring that down. The key with kaolin clay is the repeat applications, is maintaining that barrier. So it does mean a lot more spraying, but uh, it, it also is more of a natural way of, of deterring leafhoppers than, uh, than using a pyganic. Okay, also a word of warning, if you're using surround in a season long program, it can delay bricks accumulation by a week or more. So not using it in really late season varieties, late in the season is, is recommended. Um, uh, so, you know, stop your surround applications a little earlier on, um, just so that we can be able to get everything right. Uh, last slide, uh, looking at berry moth, our, our spray options are bacillus products uh, or in trust. Again, bacillus products need to be timed effectively and they have to be ingested. So again, that product has to be there as they're emerging out of the eggs. So the target stage is that egg hatch stage. In trust, uh, it's an organic spinosad material, uh, contact based. So you can wait until just a little after egg hatch to be able to get those. Um, but again, you're dealing with a, a quite an expensive material and again, only really using it where we need it in higher pressure scenarios. My ideal scenario would just be to use maiden disruption um, around Niagara. It seems to have worked quite well as long as you're large enough to make it work. Uh, season long activity, the nice thing is you don't have to worry about timings. You don't have to worry about spray timings. You put them up and you, you don't worry about it. Um, needs to be applied prior to first flight of the first generation. So you don't need to put it on right in the spring. You have until about early to mid June to get them out to disrupt that, that true um, first generation. Um, also want to secure these to the highest wire because the pheromones are slightly more dense than air and they do tend to drop out a little bit. So uh, we want to be sure that, that the pheromones are, are as high up as possible to be able to disrupt mating. And that is what I have guys. So um, I hope that sparks some conversation and I'd be happy to take any, any questions or comments on any of that. Um, <clears throat> Ron had one comment that Timorex Gold is not actually an oil. I don't know if Ron wants to speak up or yoke about that. I don't know if they're still on. Yeah, yeah Wendy, it's... Um... It's a terpene, eh? It acts more like an alcohol than an oil. And the, the label that we have for that thing is, uh, it's always been a big frustration for me for Timorex, but um, that, that, is, uh, that is the case. Um, within 48 hours, it acts more like an alcohol and it evaporates. There's no, uh, there's no residue left. Um, 
James Copeland did some research for us too on a trial on some on Gerbera and mixed the uh, sulfur with Timorex and there was compatibility there. So we need to do more work to understand what that compatibility looks like in grapes, but that's that's a good comment to make is that it's uh, it's it shouldn't be classified as a you know as a mineral oil because it's it's definitely not. But that's interesting. It's been mixed with sulfur with some success because that was one of the uh, was one of the things that they were concerned about when initially bringing that product out was the compatibility. So um, good to know. And if we can get that price point down, I could see maybe a little more use. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Line, just say it on the on the label too that it's not compatible with uh, with sulfur. So yeah, it's 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 a label issue and how that thing was presented originally, and uh, we're still combating that. So it's all good. Just a comment that uh, Ryan prevent, presenting a spray program does not mean he is ignoring the importance of cultural management. So uh, this is just on top of uh, using cover crops, managing bigger. Uh, you did mention the, the leaf removal and, and that kind of stuff. So definitely um, it's not, it's a, the ecosystem has to be considered as Tom mentioned as well. So he's not ignoring that. It just, this was what I asked him to do. So that's what he did. Okay. Um, Aaron, are you on? Uh, yeah, I'm here. Okay. Do you have slides or do you just want to talk about what you did? No, I'll just, I'll just talk. I don't have any slides. I've been pretty busy the last couple of weeks. So, um, there's a few products. Aaron that, had a baby yeah. recently, guys. Just yes, so you know. I did. <laughs> Congratulations. Thank you. Um, there's a few products that I want to touch base on that I know Ryan talked about as well. Um, Lifeguard and Stargus, they are phenomenal products. Um, I think even when, when used together, because Lifeguard does put the plant into a defense mode, and we've actually used it in conventional sites this year as well. 2020 being an optimal year, so, but uh, I think going forward, it'll be huge products. Stargus is another one that I actually really enjoyed. We actually cut our sulfur, our copper rates right in half uh, this year with Stargus. And I think it, it's gonna be another great rotational product going forward. Um, I will touch base on Timorex and Diplomat because I think those are two products that should be used in organics because Timorex has, we've noticed has great success with powdery and botrytis. And I will defend that product to a T. Um, we have not mixed it with sulfur. I don't know if I would because I think you can actually eliminate a lot of the sulfur use. Uh, same with Diplomat. Diplomat is, a, I think, is one of the better products out there because it covers so much um, between bot, powdery, and downy. It's another product that I think you can actually maybe just put a kilo of cumulus in just as a sticker, but it's a great product and I think everyone should be using it, especially if it's, uh, once it gets a, a certification behind it. Uh, I can use these products because we have a field that we take care of that is, there's no certification behind it, but we do follow organic protocols. And I got to try out a lot of products out, which is pretty cool. Um, another big product that I really, really enjoy, and I'm glad I got convinced to try it out is Serafil. I think it's one of the strongest products out there. And I will be using it more often going forward, especially when mixed with Lifeguard. We did try that out as well. And I think those two products together are a big powerhouse product. Um, I can give rates as well too. I've got lots of different rates from playing with people um, from talking to these, uh, the reps and what to use. Um, we use Lifeguard in conventional and we actually did it with, uh, we use it for, for, uh, for Downy and we actually boosted it with Fostral. And I think the two products together are just absolutely phenomenal. We got almost zero Downy this year and this year again being a optimal year. So I think going forward, We'll be using this product more and testing it out and just seeing how it can, get, can uh, be used. But in 2019, we had a great year with Diplomat and Timorex, and I think those two products should be looked at more often for organics. Any questions? I know it's coming from a grower, but uh, I do have quite a bit of experience now lately with some new products. Does Diplomat have organic certification? Yeah. Uh, I no, don't. Yet. Uh, we're in the process of getting that. Okay. I think it, I think it. I think it should be. Yeah. 
So also in the U.S. is Omri listed, uh, same actors, and that's uh, we're going to follow that same uh, um, Omri application. Okay, there's a question from Harold. Uh, it'd be nice to know which certifying bodies approve various products. Uh, Harold, the challenge with that is that the certifying companies won't tell us. They won't share their lists. At least they won't with me. I don't know if they will with, with Matt or somebody else, but I've been completely unsuccessful in getting access to EcoCert or ProCert. So in Pub360, when something is listed as potentially organic, we actually have to go to the organic group in Quebec and get their information because their provincial people seem to be more approachable than ours. So. Okay, um, Pat, you're up next, unless there are other questions. Could I ask a question before I start? Certainly, and yeah. Tim's back on, so you can ask Tim if you want. Okay, well, this question goes to Lifeguard and the rate range. Uh, is that rate range specific to different uh, diseases, or um, can somebody, um, you know, expand on that for me, please? Greg isn't <laughs> on, but I would think that, and sorry if I'm, oh, sorry, Cody, you're on, go ahead. Yeah, sorry, I'll jump in here. So I'm Cody Levin from UAP. Um, the rate range is completely based on water volume concentration. So the higher rate, if you're going at 1000 liters per hectare, you are going to have to go at that higher rate about 330 grams of lifeguard. But trials they've been doing and finding good success with is about 4.5 ounces per 100 gallons, which is the same as about 127 grams per per 375 liters and that's per hectare. And that's kind of the rate that they've been doing in the trials. And that's the kind of the most efficacious and cost-effective rate they've been going at. And SRP, when they're going at that, it's probably like 21 bucks a, an acre. Um, so not that, not that expensive either. Um, but obviously if you are going at higher water volumes in your, in your vineyard, you're gonna have to increase the rate. Okay, thanks, Cody. That's good information. I think what I'll do is try to assemble uh, how to use lifeguard blog for the for on fruit. Run it by Cody and Greg, and make sure that I've hit all the high points as far as how to use it, and uh, get that out to the group. Okay, and and the question to Tim again was on uh, apples for plum curculio. Uh, with his uh, insecticide. Uh, it was being mixed with the surround, I believe. And I just wanted to know what was the heavy lifter in that combination? Sure, no, good question. Uh, Plump Curculio has been a little bit of a pet project of mine for a long time, because <laughs> I know it's such a difficult pest and it's a, it's a uh, especially for organic growers, it can, you know, keep you out of production. So, um, We've looked at both Venerate and Grandivo on it. So originally we thought Venerate was a stronger product. Now we can kind of lean more towards Grandivo. So in our tank mix, we're actually cutting the rate of uh, surround by half. So we're typically going out with like 25 pounds per acre uh, plus the Grandivo. So it, it's definitely a situation where both are bringing something to the table. Okay, good. Hey, Pat, are you going to share your screen? I could give it a, a hoot here. If I find, oh, here we are. Okay, Aaron says that he used the 127 gram rate with great success. That was in an experimental trial, right, Aaron? Because it's not labeled. Oh, that's surround, sorry. Oh, that's life card, sorry, okay. Got it. Never mind. Go for it, so, Pat. Ready to go? Okay. So I have the pleasure of uh, bringing up the rear here, I think. So um, I'm going to start with the soil. Basically, uh, I've done a lot of uh, soil recs based on soil analysis for both apple and grape growers this year. And I'm seeing more in, uh, requests and interest for GPS uh, sampling. Uh, 
growers can basically go to their fertilizer dealer. Uh, they're probably also, also doing field crops. Uh, the field crop grid has been standard at about one sample per hectare. Uh, with higher value crops for the last, we've been doing GPS uh, with growers for the last, uh, say, 20 years or so, and we've been going at about 1.5 acres per sample. Um, making sure that whoever's doing the sampling uh, can either uh, GPS identify the sampling sites so that we can use the same sites and correlate the data for tissue sampling for the uh, bloom leaf blade or the verizon pedial and on, on apple for the uh, early tissue sampling and the fruitlet sample. Uh, another way of putting it is that you're looking for a consistent soil type that your crop is on. So you're looking at the cation exchange capacity or the, or the soil uh, uh, structure. Uh, and the cation can uh, exchange capacity is simply just the, uh, is your soil triangle, the amount of sand, silt, and clay. So you're trying to identify a, a similar type of soil uh, for that sampling process. Um, here's just an example from my own uh, vineyard plantings and uh, sample 1A and sample 9. Uh, were planted in 2013, and then we have 10A and 10B, which we're going to be, which we're going to be planted at a later date. And you can see the the difference in in improving those um, um, uh, levels. Looking at your phosphorus levels, for example, um, uh, magnesium levels, etc., and uh, some of your micros like boron and zinc, that you know. Uh, in it, just because we're in an organic system, it doesn't mean we don't have materials and methods to, to put our soils into um, uh, the correct status prior to planting. Uh, this is a, a soil health test report, which is something else you can opt for when you have your soils done. It's uh, about double the price of a, a simple mineral sample uh, from the previous stage uh, page. It gives uh, your mineral uh, uh, status similar to the, the uh, previous sample, but it also gives you, if you look at the box in the left-hand side there, you'll see some ratios and some other information. It gives you your, your base saturation of your cations. It also gives you the uh, potash to magnesium ratio that is critical and uh, gives you a, a GFI, which is a general fertility index based on the, the amount of the mineral and the balance of those minerals. Uh, the next box over in the center uh, gives you uh, uh, your pH uh, parameters, but also uh, nitrate N, which is an important factor in soil health. Uh, the third box over is where they extract the actual organic carbon, uh, organic nitrogen and inorganic nitrogen. And finally, uh, the box on the right hand side is your respiration uh, that they, they will measure the respiration of the soil microbes within your sample. Uh, they'll give you a, a re, uh, take a reactive carbon reading and then uh, end with an actual soil health index number. Um, the factors from this, these tests that affect the soil micro herd and affect yield uh, are based on highest to lowest. You can see it's that general fertility index. Uh, which goes back to the idea of proper soil optimum levels and soil balancing. Uh, and you're, you can see that potash plays a large role in the, uh, the influence on the soil microbes uh, in the base saturation of potash and also the potash to magnesium ratio. The nitrate N uh, is also critical. And then the, uh, some other factors like high salt index, uh, number eight there, the soluble salts level. Um, last um, 
in March, I, I gave a, a talk to the uh, Nova Scotia grape growers uh, on biologicals and biological products. And uh, uh, the moderator during the talk asked the question uh, uh, in the chat of how many growers were um, conventional growers, how many were organic growers, and how many were somewhere in between. And one of the comments that came back from a grower was that I'm in between because it's uh, it's not possible or too difficult to uh, to do uh, fertility programs in organic uh, production units. So I just wanted to spend a couple seconds on a few slides here. Uh, this one is uh, uh, taking is one way of looking at at feeding a feeding a soil and it's based on crop removal and you can see tree fruits apples pears and peaches uh, and the, these yields are all uh, bushels or tons per acre you can see the high removal values of some of things especially like potash uh, nitrogen and magnesium for tree fruits uh, can, and compare that to grapes at uh, uh, lower removals, even though potash is, is, is removed in a great extent. So if you're producing five tons to the, uh, to the acre, you just multiply these uh, figures by five. Uh, this is an example of an organic apple annual fertility program. Uh, we, need, uh, we need an N input in apples. Uh, and we're looking at uh, either a compost addition of about eight tons to the acre. Is it just me or can anybody else hear Pat? No, I've lost them too. Yep, same here. I think he might be frozen. <laughs> which if you're biodynamic has been, uh, which is, comes from Quebec and is uh, 532. No, we've lost him completely. Yeah, sounded like a bandwidth issue. Yeah, well, he's up north. I, I don't know where he is, but he's, yeah, he's probably at home. So, okay, so while we're waiting for Pat to come back on, uh, Bruno asked if anybody's used calcium silicate instead of surround. Bruno, can you unmute yourself and tell us whether you've used it or not, please? Can you hear me? Yep, we lost you there for a bit. Oh, you okay now? So far. Uh, no, the reason I'm asking that because uh, surround is uh, aluminum silicate and I'm not re really proud of using aluminum on my organic grapes. And um, calcium silicate is a really fine product. And I'm just wondering if anybody had played around with it. It seems like it does a similar job to the surround and probably a little bit more uh, beneficial to the plant. So I'm just wondering if anybody else has, has tried it. I think it's uh, called wolacinite or something. Um, it, so you use it at the same rate that the surround label would use? Well, this is all, I just tried it on a few plants just to see what it would do. And okay. of course, it, the, the price is a lot lower than surround. But um, yeah, it, it, you could try, and again, the rates uh, are not, um, I, you can play around with that. And I, I, just, I just tried a little bit, and I used quite a bit less than, than surround because it's, uh, it's quite more dense. Um, how should I say it's, uh, the specific gravity is quite, quite a bit more, but it does seem to stay in solution as long as you have a lot of agitation. So it just thought I just uh, thought I'd throw out there. Thank you. Pat, back to you. Pat, are you unmuted? We can't hear you.
How's that now? Okay, now I can hear you. Okay, great, thanks. So going on to uh, phosphorus inputs, uh, CalFOS, uh, it's uh, usually applied every three years. Uh, it's uh, the available phosphorus in CalFOS is only 3%, but it's colloidal rock phosphate. So it's like a clay colloid, uh, which is mineralized by soil microbes. Uh, it contains actually 23% uh, uh, P2O5. Uh, and so uh, it's a slow release type form. Uh, organic approved KMAG uh, application that will supply about 30 pounds of actual K2O, 30 pounds of sulfur and 15 pounds of magnesium. Uh, uh, sulfate of potash, again, uh, it's 50% uh, K2O. And for uh, the micro, uh, micronutrients, uh, Boron, I like to apply uh, in a solution uh, through a, a herbicide type sprayer just to get a, a more even application over a vineyard or, or an orchard. Uh, zinc, manganese, and copper can be blended into the uh, CalFOS KMAG SOP blend. And usually uh, these applications are only required every four or five years, of course, depending on your cation exchange capacity. If it's low, you're on a sand and it leaches. And if it's high, you're on a, a, clay, a clay loam and it maintains itself. Um, uh, myself, I always have an input uh, annually in the fall of a product called manure pit liquefier. Uh, which contains bacteria, fungi, and algae. Uh, as the name states, it's used to, uh, to uh, open up or, or break up uh, manure, uh, liquid manure pits and make them more uh, uh, mixable for, so a farmer can spread the liquid manure. Uh, and then in the fall uh, and spring, I apply uh, BD uh, Biodynamic Preparation 500, which is uh, horn manure. Okay, I'm having a problem here with uh, screen movement. Yeah. Uh, any help on getting my screen to move from a technical point? Matt, any ideas? Pat, maybe you could right click and uh, just press next. Okay. All right. Thanks, Matt. No problem. Uh, so here's a, an Apple a nutrition program that's put out by Bartlett for organic growers. Uh, there is a change this year that the, the main products, which used to be called the light, L-I-T-E, there's been a name change to Enviro. And uh, same products, same uh, analysis and same rates. So nothing has changed there. Uh, this is the uh, wine grape nutrition program, organic. Again, the change just basically change in name. The other change is that uh, this year, uh, we have uh, an actual uh, foliar iron that's av available for use um, uh, for those growers in Prince Edward County who are dealing with uh, calcium-induced Lyme chlorosis. You can see the two uh, timings there, the early timings. And, uh, and then there's the uh, set and pea size berry timings for uh, iron productivity to increase berry size and yield. Now, the last thing I just wanted to, to bring out was um, some information on soil biostimulants for, for transplants. And it was uh, great to hear Justine's uh, presentation. It's the first time I've heard it. And I just want to give you some of my experience uh, 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 on, this, on the same type of uh, information. 
Uh, I've been using uh, Stellamare sea kelp uh, since uh, 1987 on vegetable and apple and grape transplants. And uh, the rate of 3.5 mils per liter in a dip solution uh, the, uh, a day before planting uh, uh, seems to be a rate that uh, it is enough. And uh, at uh, lesser rates, uh, I've seen uh, lesser response. But the important thing is that it should be followed by a drench um, uh, in, in about 20 days with the same solution content. Um, on an apple tree, uh, I usually give a, a liter. Uh, on a vine, I give a half liter. Um, my experience with mycorrhizal products uh, like uh, MycoApply, uh, I've also tried Active, and uh, I do trials that last for three years uh, because of the difference in growing seasons and, and changing trials uh, throughout the period to maybe different timings. And uh, on, my, uh, on my farm with both apple and grape transplants, I after digging uh, up the plants and sacrificing them and looking at root systems and root and weights, I've not seen any uh, increases and I guess I'm like Justine's growers who are wondering, you know, what's going on here. Uh, on the other hand, uh, with other growers using the same products on uh, different sites, uh, usually lower fertili fertility sites, uh, low organic matter sites, my organic matters are usually in the four to five percent, and low cation exchange capacity soils or sandy soils. Uh, uh, I have seen responses uh, with these products. So it brought me down to the debate of should I be feeding, trying to feed microbes versus trying to inoculate or introduce microbes on a, on a soil like my own. In 2019, I uh, did a trial with a product called Biomax. And in 2020, I did a, a, a another trial with a product called soil set and these are both on apple transplants uh, the biomax product uh, i couldn't get a lot of information out of the manufacturer it basically it was a fermented they told me it was fermented food sources uh, enzymes and the two micros zinc and manganese um, so basically i in 2020 i looked at um, uh, another product, um, and this product was um, called the uh, Soil Set. It's uh, produced by a company uh, in Kentucky called Alltech Crop Science, um, and it's a fermentation type product where they're fermenting uh, bacteria or yeast and enzymes uh, with a substrate, uh, of course, a feed source of sugar and carbohydrates and basically uh, producing the metabolites of fermentation. There is no live bacteria or no live yeast in these products. It's simply the metabolites. And when you look at the list on the right, uh, you have things like amino acids, enzymes, uh, organic acids. And for example, when you take an amino acid and, and combine it with a, an organic acid like carboxylic acid, you're producing peptides, you're producing a peptide bond, which goes on to produce polypeptides and proteins. So it's just a different uh, way of, of, uh, of plant initiation. Um, this is a trial that was done by the National Academy of Agricultural Science in the Ukraine in 2015 using soil set uh, and uh, at the rate of 1.2 liters per hectare. Uh, and you can see the response on specific bacteria, um, um, more nitrogen type fixing bacteria like uh, azobacter and a modifying bacteria and mineral type nitrogen bacteria. But the other thing that is interesting is to look at the mobilization of the minerals in the soil that were measured in these trials. Uh, the mobilization of phosphorus in the soil was 90%. And uh, the Alltech company, which has been in fermentation technology for, for a long time, uh, basically they're leaders in uh, animal uh, 
food and uh, health products through fermentation. They have uh, nutrigenomic labs. Uh, there's one in Kentucky and one in uh, for Europe in um, Ireland. And nutrigenomics is simply the study of, of uh, the effect of nutrients uh, on, on genetic expression, on up, up regulating and down re regulating genes within the plants. So if the plant biome for grape uh, is, is mapped, which it is, or apple, which it is, then they can, they can test these products and look at the up regulation and down regulation which helps leads to for practical use for a grower to uh, actual timings of application. Um, so this is a uh, this is uh, some of the work that I do here on the farm, and these are the rates that I've I've been using uh, to get responses. The it's uh, of course it's a U.S. product, so it's in ounces per acre, but it equates to that Ukrainian study of uh, 1.2 liters per hectare. Uh, on apple transplants, I use a liter of solution per tree. On vines, I use a half liter per tree. Um, the product also contains sulfur and uh, specific uh, micronutrients. Uh, these micronutrients are important for early mineralization by soil microbes and almost act as a feed source and a release uh, of the mineralized uh, microbes uh, to the plant. Uh, I repeat every 30 days. The labels uh, often state 30 to 45 days because they know that uh, that the, the, uh, the response usually lasts about 40 days. Um, in a drench solution, uh, because uh, Stella Maris has been very successful for me, I always use the 3.5 mil per liter rate in a, in a pre-plant dip and also in the drench. And uh, in my trials last year, I added soil set to some of the uh, trial areas at three mils per liter in the drench. Uh, I don't think it would be necessary to dip these, uh, these plants overnight in the solution. I think uh, we're trying to feed the microbes that are already in the soil system. Um, here for grapes would be uh, if you just look at the, the um, red uh, balloons and uh, the top uh, row there, soil set. There's a rate for established vines. And you can see that to the far left, that is uh, at bud swell. And uh, secondly, uh, after harvest before senescence. Um, for new plantings, uh, the same rate, the 1.2 uh, liters per hectare is applied just before uh, you get new leaf growth. Um, in the same timings as early flowering, fruit set, and during, uh, during fruit growth and during the ripening period. And lastly, uh, if you look at the apple program for apple transplants, uh, you can see that uh, the timings again in the red balloons uh, only are at, uh, at uh, bud swell uh, first color is first pink, um, just prior to fruit set, uh, pea sized fruit, and during the maturation program uh, process. And I'm pretty sure that that is it. Nope, that's it. Okay, thank you, Pat. Are there You're any welcome. questions? Okay. Uh, do you have a, uh, a total cost for that um, nutrient program on grapes? Like, do you, do you have it broken down per, per hectare or per acre? Uh, is that the foliar program, Ryan? Yeah, the one that you outlaid with all the different growing stages and then uh, the, the, the products underneath. Yeah, we do, we do have that and we do it in a basis of return on investment. Okay. I don't have that at the top of my head. But uh, I could get back to you on on actually the the price 
And because you can see there, there's a general program, right? That we recommend to everyone. And then there are programs for specific things, you know, whether you're trying to uh, reduce uh, uh, retritis bunch rot with calcium, et cetera. But I, I could put something together for you, Ryan. Yeah, just more curious uh, yep. to, to spur for cost benefit analysis from, from myself too. Um, follow up question in Do you feel that even that base program is important um, even under high fertility soils? Um, you know, in some areas of Niagara, we were dealing with, with lots of overvigor and lots of fertility. Um, is that general program still recommended in those scenarios? Well, it, it, it depends. It, it, basically, the, the micronutrients, you know, are, are physiologically timed the, the manganese, the magnesium, the zinc, and the boron, for example. Um, whether you need, uh, you know, large amounts of phosphorus is another thing, right? Um, so it's, it is specific to, you know, a, a high fertility versus a lower fertility. But uh, uh, these programs are all designed based on physiologically when the need curve is there for the specific nutrient. And uh, if there is a lack for whatever reason, you know, uh, stress or whatever, then the, um, the mineral is applied at those times. Okay, that's great. I think it really highlights the importance too of routine tissue and soil sampling too to, to keep track of these and to, uh, to, to really identify if you're going overboard or if you really, if you need more. Um, so, so uh, uh, oh, that's great. Thanks, Pat. I just also wanted to ask, I'm not sure whether you may have covered this. I might have uh, had to step out, so I might have missed it. But uh, the importance, do you, do you always recommend um, doing uh, testing, lab testing on your compost or any of your manure applications for nutrients as well too, Pat? Um, I have done that in the past, but I see very little difference in analysis numbers. So I, I haven't, I haven't sent samples in for a bioassay on, on compost or anything or, or an al a mineral analysis or, or anything. Uh, uh, basically, the, the numbers uh, are relatively stable. You're getting it from the same source, I'm assuming, though, like? Yeah, this is, uh, I'm, I'm biodynamic, so this is all on farm source. Oh, OK. Yeah. Uh, I, uh, your question, if it pertains to, you know, someone sourcing manures from off farm, sure, it's always a good idea to know what you're applying. Okay, thank you. I'll throw one more caveat into that. Sorry for talking so much. Um, <laughs> um, I, I've done a lot of analysis on compost materials and especially compost materials with any type of mushroom compost within it. Um, you really have to watch those salt levels, those EC readings. Because um, that really is the limiting factor, what I, I see as far as application rates with some of those composts. So um, I always like to have an analysis before I recommend, especially compost to growers. Um, and in salts are the major concern. Okay, this is the part of the agenda where the growers are supposed to bring up any topics that they want to discuss, or are you all burnt out from? three and a half hours of Zoom and we should try another time for more discussion if you guys give me some topics. Is anybody there? <laughs> yeah, we're here, Wendy. <laughs> oh. I have a question for the group. Are you guys interested in, uh, I was thinking of doing a cover crop, uh, a separate meeting similar to this, uh, but looking at cover crops, is there any interest in that? Okay, we're seeing definitely and yes in the in the chat. Mm -hmm. Thanks, guys. So that'll that maybe that can be the topic for the next the next group discussion. Uh, somebody had asked what everybody's doing about virus vines. I don't mm -hmm. know if you want to talk about that now or do we wait? Mm -hmm. 
Okay. I think I think we're gonna we're gonna crop it. We're gonna crop it. We're gonna cut it short here now uh, or long. Um, thank you everybody for staying tuned as long as you have. I know everybody's zoomed out. Mm -hmm. um, as I said, I will make this available as a recording and let you know when it's up so that you can tune in for anything that you had to walk away from. So thank you very much. Thank you everyone. Thanks. Take care. Thanks, Wendy. Thanks for organizing. Yep, thanks, Wendy. Thanks for the chance to participate. Appreciate it. Thanks, Wendy. This was great. See ya. Thanks. See ya. See you soon.